order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, July 17th, 2023. I am Select Board Chair Eric Helmuth. Tonight's meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023 signed into law on March 29th, 2023, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation in public meetings until March 31st, 2025. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted in the select board chambers and over Zoom. It is being recorded and simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, we ask you to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and people watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials found on the town's website, specifically the select board agendas and minutes page. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. Before uh, we go further, I want to uh, mention that our town manager uh, was, was uh, stuck uh, out of state due to the, all the flights to Boston being canceled yesterday. And I understand, sir, that your uh, first flight available was tomorrow, so he has to join us uh, remotely. So uh, thank you for doing so. Good to be here. So you're not here for the party. Um, we will, um, yeah, we have all our select board members here, so we can take our, uh, we're not going to take more all boys votes as a matter of course. Okay, first up on the agenda, we have the consent agenda. Uh, this is approval of the minutes of, of two meetings, June 21st and June 26th of this year. Request for a special one-day beer and one wine license on the 27th of July at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a town manager retirement party. Uh, request for another uh, such license at Reservoir Beach on August the 18th for the Beach Concert Series and Beer Gardens. It's a continuation request from a prior approval. Request special one-day beer and wine license on August 26th at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event. And a request uh, for another special one-day beer and wine license August 26th of this year at Reservoir Beach for Reservoir Dogs. No entertaining discussion or motions? Second. Any discussion? Reservoir Dogs. That's an interesting event. Yeah, so, so, so it's cool. So we also have in the... The event at um, um, the Jason Russell House on Saturday that week? Do, do, do we know? If we are, it's not on the consent agenda, but. Um, no, no, I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool that we might have two. Are we on the 26th? Well, is that the are we also having, you know, a uh, beer garden at um, Jason Russell on the 26th? Not that I've heard of, no. Okay, all right. So, all right, all right, just curious. Just, if we're having two on one day, that would be an interesting demand situation, you know. So, so. The kind of questions I ask early in the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Any further discussion? No. On a motion by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Approval of the consent agenda. Next up, we have for approval, a Middle Eastern Dance Show by Saeed at Whittemore Park on Thursday, August 17th, 2023, and that is from Claudia Donnett. Um, I have been in touch with, with Ms. Donnett and also the Arlington Cultural Council, she had a work conflict tonight. She's scheduled for her job and just despite her best efforts could not be here. So I uh, procured some information from her ahead of time and I can inform the board. <coughs> she has done two of these same events uh, at Broadway Plaza in town uh, previously that were successful. She was uh, awarded a, a cash grant from the Arlington Cultural Council for these programs. And she would be very happy uh, if, you, I, I suggest the board could either move approval tonight or if they want, move a conditional approval and empower the chair to approve based on any questions you might want me to bring back to her um, tonight. Or you can, you know, you can do whatever you want. But those, I, I, I talked with her enough and, and received a very nice letter from Brian McMurray, who's on the, um, the uh, Cultural Council to, um, to kind of vouch for uh, their being impressed with the program. Mrs. Mahan. Um, I'd like to move approval subject to all conditions here and, and with the understanding that um, the start and date time is just a housekeeping thing. Where it says 6 p.m. to 7.15, um, it's the board's understanding of vote because of what's below. It'll, it's 5.30 to 9 p.m. 
with That's setup and breakdown. Thank you. Technicalities matter. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mahan. In a courtroom, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Seconds. With no questions. Any further discussion? All right. On a motion from Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimously approved. <coughs> Okay, item eight, we have a uh, license under licenses and permits. We have a four approval common vigilar license, Turmeric House, um, Ananda Parkrell, 444 Massachusetts Avenue. Yes, yeah, come on up to the table. Yeah. Um, Welcome. Thank you, sir. Please, please uh, introduce yourself and summarize your uh, application. Uh, I'm sorry? You introduce yourself and, and summarize your presentation and your application. Yes. Um, so we are applying for the, uh, we, we, we have a restaurant in Turmeric House, and we are applying this license for the, uh, egg, we are actually buying existing business, uh, Rangla Punjab, and changing name to Turmeric House. Uh, it will be Indian and Nepali cuisine. So I've been working in this, I'm executive chef for the restaurant as, as well as a partner, and he's my general manager, Mahesh Shai. Uh, we have a bill, uh, we have a team, so we've, we are looking forward to do business in uh, Arlington, Massachusetts for a while. Uh, luckily, we got the place, so we are eager to do business here. Thank you. And I'll turn to the board for any questions, comments, motions. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Approve approval and one comment. Please. Please. Welcome to Arlington. Thank you very much. Um, I know because you've done this before and as, as your manager that you're well versed with it and you definitely have a maintenance plan um, as well as this is a pre-existing. Did you say where one of the Punjabs were? Is that where you're going in? Uh, Rangala Punjab. Oh, okay. And just, just so you know, um, where um, we have a lot of residences that are near the businesses, there seems to be this unusual thing that happens that when a new restaurant and or manager comes in, somehow the delivery trucks, which have a routine established with the previous restaurant and manager, mm -hmm. somehow you, sometimes they bump you to a more inopportune time for the neighbors. So if you could just make sure that when you're there, just say, um, want to keep the same time. Sure, so we'll, that, we'll know, coordinate with the city hall rules, whatever it is, rules, we'll, we'll follow it. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Second. Second. Further discussion or questions? Okay. On a motion to approve by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 Mr. Carter, unanimous. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you for doing business in the Thank you, everybody. Good luck. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. All right, next up we have uh, the continuation of the hearing for approval in all alcohol package store from Nikon at 232, Nikon 232 Incorporated, uh, Yashika Patel, owner manager 232 Mass Ave, Andrew Upton, attorney. Welcome back, folks. Good evening, everyone. Andrew Upton for the applicant with me. Uh, Thank you. And before you start, I just want to inform uh, the public and the board that um, at, the, at the last hearing, we had um, informal public comment during the open, uh, open forum period of, of the portion of the meeting, which followed immediately the presentation. I'm very confident that, that the board members uh, were attentive to that. However, I learned after the meeting that as a matter of procedural technicality, those comments were not, would not be considered on the record for the purposes of the alcohol, the package store license hearing that we are now commencing. Therefore, I uh, contacted or asked my colleagues in the board office to contact each person who made informal comments at a pre previous meeting, whether or not they were in favor or opposed, and invited them to come tonight for a formal period of public comment, either in the room here or over Zoom. So with my apologies to those of you uh, who may be uh, here for a second time, I wanted to make that clear and explain why you may be hearing uh, from the same people uh, again. So tonight, we will, after a presentation from the applicant, I will entertain public comment, and then I'll turn to the board for questions and comments and motions. 
Mr. Heim, Attorney Heim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you like me to just uh, refresh everybody in terms of where we yes. are in posture? That would be excellent. Thank you, sir. Terrific. So uh, at the initial hearing, the applicant uh, presented a basic uh, presentation with respect to their applications for a package store. Um, and the board engaged in some colloquy and discussion. There were some questions about the substance of the application. However, uh, the board expressed some concern about some updates that had been made to the application and really what was going to be before the board in terms of what it was voting on. So it requested that the applicant formally revise their application and come back for further discussions and consideration before the board. Uh, just so we're uh, clear in terms of the scope of the inquiry, uh, the board's received a memo with respect to the sort of criteria for evaluating any package store license application uh, throughout the Commonwealth. If the board has any questions about that, I'm happy to address them. Uh, whether you, if you decide to grant the license tonight, you may put certain reasonable conditions on that license. If you decide to deny the license, you want to make sure that you have enough information to provide the basis for a written decision. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Heim. That was most helpful. Any questions from my colleagues as to the procedure for tonight's hearing before we begin? Okay, I turn it over to Attorney Upton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. Andrew Upton for the applicant. Uh, with me is Nilesh Patel, who is the husband of the proposed manager, uh, Yashika Patel. She was here at the last meeting to uh, discuss and demonstrate her qualifications. Uh, unfortunately, she was in the hospital today uh, due to some medical issues. And although she is home now and may be joining us if there are some essential questions, uh, I'd like to ask the board's permission to have Mr. Patel stand in if there's any directly relevant yeah. questions. Without objection? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and with uh, best wishes for a speedy recovery for your, uh, for your partner. Um, if it pleases the board, I will request that uh, you incorporate by reference the previous testimony so we don't uh, do the same thing again tonight. I'll be glad to sort of summarize what we had, make some new points, and then we're certainly glad to answer any questions or engage in any dialogue with the board or uh, any community members. Thank you. That'll be fine. Okay. Uh, so as we mentioned, the character and fitness of this applicant is strong. Uh, the proposed manager is a college graduate. Uh, she is TIPS trained. She lives one town over in Cambridge. She has five years experience in ID checking and adult use running a smoke shop uh, where they sell higher end products. She is a mass citizen. She has a clean record. Uh, this is a family business. Uh, it is owned by the Patel family. It is capitalized by the Patel family. Uh, and they have been approved in both Boston and Tewksbury to hold liquor licenses uh, just this year already. Um, the uh, as well as TIPS training, all the staff will be trained, and uh, they have a program at their uh, other stores where they have up to 30 different closed circuit uh, cameras, both inside and outside. And depending on town regulations and their discussion uh, with the police department, uh, should they be granted a license, they would put in that same security system and uh, would be willing to share that with the police department, as they do in Boston, uh, should there be an incident inside or should there be a different kind of incident, even not involving them outside, uh, they routinely interact with the police and let them have access to those videos. Um, we also believe there is a public need for a license at this location. This is a storefront that has been empty for two years. Uh, it has been retail for almost a, over a generation. Uh, we are proposing a boutique wine store uh, featuring craft beers, premium wines. It will be clean. It will be well lit. Uh, it will have higher quality products. Uh, what they want to do is have wine tasting, wine education, and wine pairing, uh, which both engages the community, draws a higher end clientele, and also drives sales uh, as part of the business model. Um, well, we have described a little bit of the higher-end products, and some of them are described by name in the brochure we gave you. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we don't have. We don't have single-serve bottles, uh, formerly known as nips. We don't have kegs. We don't have malt liquor. We don't have lottery. We don't have cigarettes. And we don't have candy. 
So we don't have typical lower end products and we don't have products that uh, appeal to uh, children or more casual uh, users and buyers of alcohol. Further supplementing the public want are the 85 signatures in support uh, on a letter that we have submitted. Uh, we also have two letters from the abutting businesses. Uh, that's the Venice Italian Kitchen and the Novita Salon. There's uh, four slots in that block, as you probably know. One is the post office, uh, and I believe the landlords have spoken to them and they are supportive, but because they're federal employees, they wouldn't sign any letters. Uh, but the other two are in favor. Uh, that also goes, we believe, to the timing where the post office and the salon do most of their business between 9 and 4, where liquor store is typically early evening or Saturday afternoons. So in terms of sort of the burden of traffic, both foot and automotive, we believe that's a nice balance uh, on that block. Um, the uh, woman that helped us uh, collect the signatures from the neighbors and residents. Uh, I'm going to submit an affidavit from her about her process of collection, but I'll summarize. Uh, as she was out there, she stayed mostly on the block where the store is, um, just talking to people who were neighbors or nearby shoppers. And while she was basically describing the concept and asking them to sign a letter of support, a lot of them had various comments. So in order to strengthen the business and the business model, you know, we always engage the stakeholders and, uh, you know, the owner learns from that process. But it was interesting that so many people had comments about it, including request for service of kombucha, request for a large variety of cocktail mixers, uh, request for fever tree cocktail mixers, request for Esme gin, request that the store be dog friendly, request to carry poppy sparkling soda, and request that employees give guidance and suggestions on products. This person mentioned that the store down the street isn't a place to go if you want to try something new because of the lack of consultation. So those are uh, anecdotes from our outreach to the community, but I believe what this says is not only is there a strong current of support, there's enthusiasm and suggestions about how a high-end boutique store could operate, and a level of interest and excitement from the people who are just walking down the street in that area. Um, uh, we've been asked to address parking and traffic. Uh, parking is the same on that block as it always has been. It was formerly a grocery store, formerly a dry cleaner. Uh, as you know, uh, retail is typically clustered in strips on Mass Ave, and it's really no different there than anywhere else. Uh, we believe that the police do a good job with traffic and parking and pedestrian safety, uh, and that in a store, going into a place where there's always been a store, should not have any significant impact. Um, we would also like to point out that uh, there's been some concern about the proximity of other stores. Again, we believe this boutique wine store is significantly different than uh, the Mass Ave wine store, um, and it's also on another end of the strip uh, that we believe can certainly support the business. Um, much like many other businesses are clustered together on retail strips up and down Mass Ave. Um, our store is a little more like the Monotomy beer and wine store uh, in terms of the approach, the product mix. Uh, and the quality than the Mass Ave liquor store. And I thought it was worth noting that the, in terms of the public need and the density of liquor stores, that Monotomy Wine Store is now closed. Um, and not only is it closed, it is fenced off and it appears that the building is about to be raised and replaced with another building. So the chances that that is even going to exist in the next year and a half, I think are relatively slim. I think that contention is bolstered by the fact that they are posted with the wholesalers database. And the wholesalers of alcohol maintain a database of <coughs> all licensees, and if you don't pay, 
uh, they put you on the list, which is called posting, and it impacts your ability to get product from all of the wholesalers, not just the ones uh, that you're posted by. They are currently posted by six different distributors to whom they owe money. Uh, and while we weren't able to determine all of the exact amounts, it appears to be over uh, $10,000, I would say, at least. Uh, further, a brief check of the Secretary of State's uh, UCC lien database uh, indicates that they have some liens against the business. So uh, I have shopped there. They had some fine products. They're well regarded. But the fact that they are closed, the site is fenced off, the building is going to be destroyed, uh, and they appear to have some uh, debt on the business indicates to me that there's a public need for a boutique wine store of that type, uh, which I believe there would be even if we were competing with them. But the fact that they're not there uh, further supports that contention. Um, so with that, uh, I will submit the affidavit and copies of the letters from the uh, abutting businesses, and we're certainly glad to answer any questions. Thank you. So uh, the question on the affidavit, is this, do we have this submitted prior, or is this, we're just getting it now? You're just getting it now. It, it, the it, for it came, came to me today. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. As did the additional 35 letters, which I submitted. Ms. Moore, would you be able to make copies for each member of the board? Thank you, Attorney. Thank you, sir. All right, at this time, I want to open the public comment portion of this hearing. And um, so, I'll let, since I just sent Ms. Mar on an errand, let's start with the people in the room. And if you are attending on Zoom and you want to make public comments on the record for the purposes of this hearing, uh, when I announce Zoom participants, be prepared to raise your hand in Zoom, and then uh, we will call on you. So let's just start, though, with people in the room. So um, at this time, um, just we have one microphone and one table. If I could indulge um, indulge a temporary vacating of, of the limited real estate there, sure. with your understanding. Thank you. Uh, hadn't, we hadn't anticipated that practical <laughs> reality. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will welcome you back <laughs> after, after the public comment. Um, is there anyone in the uh, in the room that wants us to make a comment? Sure, please come on up. Welcome back. Thank you for your understanding of the uh, the circumstances. The, we're happy to see you again. And just introduce yourself for the record, please. Okay. Um, good evening, and thank you for listening to us tonight. Um, my name is Lisa Cronin. I am the landlord for Two Thirty Two Mass Ave. Um, while I feel it's really important to speak to you all tonight, I'm not a great public speaker, so um, I prepared just um, <clears throat> over the last 50 years, since the early 1970s, a member of my family has managed the property of stores in East Arlington that spans 232 to 242 Mass Ave. I took that over sole management in 1999. Um, across the units, um, we manage there has been a post office pizza store and a dry cleaners for most of the years. Um, if we still had it our way, we would, we would never have lost the dry cleaners. Located that previously occupied the now vacant unit um, the way we did two summers ago during COVID-19. Um, we were able to work with all the other tenants to keep them in business. But despite our efforts, the owners of, owner of the dry cleaner made the difficult decision to close um, his doors um, due to the unprecedented times and declining business, declining business. Um, between my full-time job as a registered nurse and my job as a single mom to my three sons, I've always valued positive businesses, businesses doing the right thing versus looking to make an extra dollar charging rent. Since we lost the drive cleaners, we have invested a large sum of money, of which most was borrowed, to work to replenish the vacant unit to one worthy of another business to serve the town of Arlington. Um, that being said, despite two years of marketing the property, close to $100,000 in lost rent and renovations, um, we are left with one potential tenant that we believe to be worthy of the property for discussion today. That is the liquor store seeking your approval this evening. 
Our interests have always been aligned with the community, and I felt compelled to address the community this evening to reiterate um, this fact in which I feel to be so confident every single time I think of East Arlington. I'm an Arlington Catholic alum, born and bred here. Um, I implore you to understand the opportunity we have before us this evening to replace a vacant property with potential tenants we have worked with for almost a year. Um, these are the best tenants we have found and we think we will find to fill that empty spot. Um, the opportunity being put forth this evening is one in which is truly so rare in the post-COVID environment. I'm going to allow, um, we've, we hired, in the last two years we hired a broker. Um, I'm gonna allow her to speak. If, I'm not sure if she can speak now or you gotta let other people Turn speak. Um, she's, yeah, she's in the Zoom time. Okay. Um, 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 her name is Suzanne, a chance to address the group in a, in a moment, but I really hope that there's no misunderstanding to the sincerity and importance in which this decision should be held for those that don't agree. I want what is best for Arlington. I look forward to us continuing to thrive together and hopefully welcoming our new best business owners to accompany us forward for the decades to come. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. Um, and I neglected to mention, uh, you actually hit three minutes exactly, so I'll treat everyone the same. And for, from here on out, we'll do a three minute time limit on, on public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 I didn't, I didn't set one. So you, you just set, you set the time and it was perfect. So um, that was, we're glad, glad to hear from you. And that was my fault for not uh, saying ahead of time, but uh, three minutes it is. Um, you mentioned, was it Suzanne Conway? Yes. So um, I'm very happy as a courtesy to, to uh, bring her on next um, from Zoom. So uh, Ms. Ms. Marr will promote Ms. Conway uh, to um, be able to turn off or to enable her uh, microphone and, and camera if desired. Good evening, Suzanne. Hi, how are you? Very well. Uh, please state uh, your name for the record and you have three minutes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Suzanne Conway. I work at Cabot and Company Real Estate on Newbury Street in Boston. I represent the property on Mass Ave. Um, and I've been showing the property for um, over, oops, let me turn on my camera, sorry about that. Um, I've been showing the property for over a year now. And um, by far, you know, this applicant, the Patel family, I think is the strongest candidate that we've had. Um, they've been one of the few that actually have previous business experience and they own, as Andrew has mentioned, they own several different businesses throughout the area. Um, they're also a local family, you know, in Cambridge. Um, and I think it's nice to have somebody local in that space. Um, also, it sounds like they, you know, they've really reached out to the community and have listened to what the surrounding people would like um, in the store. It, it does, it's definitely distinguished, you know, from the other liquor stores being more of a, a, a wine, um, selling high-end wine and doing tasting, which does, it's, a, it's kind of a nice community um, event that they can, they, they can offer in the area as well. Um, and also, I think it's just, it's nice to fill that space because it has been empty for so long and that will really help, you know, uplift the property values in the area. Um, so I just want to offer my experience, you know, showing the space and just different people that have come and, and see it and just how strong I think the Patel family is and will do um, a really nice job with their build out in that space. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll now turn to anyone in the room who'd like to make public comment. Mr. Fiore, thank you very much. Thank you again for your understanding. Did you say that we only have three minutes? Right. Should these, these gentlemen sit down and not stand behind me? Is that all right? Yeah, well, yeah would you mind? Uh... Thank you. Um, okay, I didn't know I only have three minutes and I talk fast anyway, so just uh, uh, give me a minute while I... Yeah, I won't start the clock till you begin. I uh, edit what I've already edited. Um, you don't have a clock here, though, do you? The, no, but I'll, I'll give you a little heads up when we're okay. about... Uh, 
30 seconds in. I'd like to thank the members of the Arlington Select Board for giving me this opportunity to speak for the record. These applicants and their attorney have created a public record of inconsistencies and misrepresentations in three communities over the past six months. The applicant's brochure misrepres misrepresents who owns 232 Mass Ave. It's owned by the Dioria Family Realty Trust and not the Coronas. The applicant's so-called letters of support are a misrepresentation of a petition. The applicant's pages in support of their packet story a simple petition of 48 signatures on 48 separate pages of paper. In contrast to the letters of concern written by residents, not even one petitioner presents one original thought. At the last select board meeting, Mr. Upton, when he was comparing store hours, said that the package store hours would not conflict with the East Ellington Post Office on Saturday because the post office was only open on Saturday morning. The East Ellington Post Office is only open Monday through Friday. It does not have Saturday hours. He's prone to misrepresentation when it isn't even necessary. I was surprised by the quote on page 8 in their brochure, which states they look forward to working with the community to establish a safe, friendly community store without negative impacts on the neighborhood. We value our relationship with the neighborhood and the community. They write that, but the reality is that they never met with the neighbors and abutters to attempt to address legitimate neighborhood concerns. In what is an act of disrespect and contempt, they responded by gathering signatures to overwhelm and drown out contrary voices. No doubt this is the shape of things to come. Why is their sister-in-law, Palak Patel, not here in Arlington? I know she lives in Mineola, New York State, and so will be an absentee package store owner but it would seem reasonable to expect her to present herself to ask for the license, answer questions from the board, and introduce herself to the community. On Sunday, June 25th, I decided to drive out to where to see the smoke shop the brochure says is owned by Yakisha Patel. There I found this. No city smoke shop, only a sign above an empty storefront. City smoke shop does not exist and has never existed. It only exists on paper. The applicants misrepresented in their brochure that they own a business that isn't in business. Deciding I needed to go the distance, I drove from where to 345 Main Street in Tewksbury. There I found this, another empty storefront. There is no city wine spirits and smoke shop. It doesn't exist. It only exists on paper. The applicants misrepresented in, in their brochure that they own two businesses that aren't now in business that have never been in business. I decided to watch the video recording of the Tewksbury Select Board meeting from January 10, 2023, when that board did, in fact, approve a package store license transfer for these applicants. At the hearing, the applicants assured the Tewksbury Select Board that they were moving to Middleton. They have assured the Arlington Select Board that they live in Cambridge. Where do they live? Which board has been misled? In response to concerns expressed by the Tewksbury... Now, or must I wait until uh, these falsehoods are complete? Sir, you will be given an opportunity to respond at the conclusion of the public comment period. Um, was, and I'll give a little bit uh, more time to Mr. Fiori. If you'd wrap it up in 30 seconds, sir. In response to concerns expressed by the Tewksbury Select Board about problems they've had with smoke shop and package stores in that town, Yakisha Patel assured them she would be hands-on micromanaging. On a Tewksbury application, she wrote in the box for hours that she would be on premises as 40-plus. At the last meeting of the Arlington Select Board, Yakisha Patel assured the board that she would be managing the store in Arlington full-time. On the Arlington application, she wrote in the box for hours should be on premises 40 plus. And I'm very sorry if you could summarize and wind it down, please. I'm, I, I would be very happy for you at the conclusion of your remarks to give a copy of these um, to Ms. Maher and she could photocopy those and, and they can uh, be. Okay, I'll, uh, just uh, let me have a few more seconds then I'll wrap it up. Okay, please do, yeah. I, I'm certain she cannot be in these two places hands on micromanaging full time at the same time, as well as your smoke shop in where her commercial business and their smoke shops in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. I'd like, to leave the, I'd like to leave the board with this thought. East Arlington has a great variety of businesses, shops, services, restaurants, and experiences. Within that variety, there is a balance. East Arlington has two package stores and two ice cream stores. A parent can bring their child to one of two ice cream stores for ice cream, while they can go to one or two package stores for alcohol. Please don't let these applicants upset that balance. Please don't let these applicants turn East Arlington into a neighborhood well, the package stores outnumber the ice cream stores. Thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Um, and if you would, uh, if you don't, if you'd like, you can hand a copy of your um, remarks to Ms. Marr and they sure. can enter them into the into the record. Thank you. Um, we will continue the public uh, public, okay. public hearing now. All right. Um, is there anybody on Zoom who would like to make public comment? Please raise your hand. And we see uh, Walt Fay. 
Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. So Mr. Fye is coming in. Good evening, Mr. Fye. You are able now to, yes, there you go. Can you hear there us? There we go. Hi, Hi there. there. Three minutes, sir. Ready? Yes. I'm a neighbor. I've been a businessman in East Arlington for 20 years or more. And I, I am opposed to the granting of this license for a liquor store basically because there's another liquor store mm, three, maybe four blocks away. And I don't really see how this adds to the neighborhood. I don't think it enhances or keeps the harmony of the businesses in the neighborhood. One of the things that the applicant stated or was that they had a couple of local businesses nearby that were into, that were for it. And I want to make a point that this is this location is kind of in what is called the Capital District, which is, you know, the shops around the Capital Theater. And I didn't see anything from uh, any support from any of the other businesses in the neighborhood that they thought that this was a good idea. And I wanted to bring that to the attention of this select board. Certainly have sympathy for the landlord and trying to rent that space, commercial space right now is tough all over. And uh, I just don't, I don't, don't see how uh, adding another liquor store on Mass Ave right close by to another liquor store is going to enhance the, the uh, quality of the, the neighborhood here. Um, one other thing I'd like to say about wine tastings in general is that uh, other liquor stores and wine stores do offer them. My experience of them, having attended a few, is that they tend to become a very, uh, they, they start out good, but they don't really seem to last and, and drive traffic so much. So I would look to, you know, wh where is the revenue from this store coming from? which would typically be the sales of beer and wine and alcohol and spirits. And again, we've got another place right down the street that offers all of that and uh, would be in direct competition with this, with this other um, existing business. So for that reason, I'm opposed. Thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. All right, is there anybody, uh, we tend to bounce back and forth uh, for public comment. Anybody else in the room who would like to make public comment for this hearing? All right. Anybody else on Zoom? Um, oh, do we have a, we have a? Oh, oh yeah, of course you do. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah, come on. Um, I'll please inter yeah, introduce yourself for the record, please. Um, I'm Ryan Cronin. I'm Lisa Cronin, the landlord, uh, the person who manages um, the block of stores um, right there, son. Um, I just wanted to emphasize some points that were said by my mom as well as Suzanne, who we've been working with. And the fact that we have been working on this for two years now, we've put a lot of time, a lot of money into the store that we don't really have um, a lot of either of those right now to get someone in there. And we've had the potential to put some other companies in there that we didn't really think were good for the town of Arlington. And we decided to move forward and to continue taking the hit to continue to make sure we found a really solid tenant. And I think that that's what we've done right now. We've been working with Nilesh and Yashika for almost a year right now to try to make sure that we have everything in order to come before you to make sure that we've heard the community. Um, and we think that they're the best tenants. We haven't heard from anyone else in the last few months since we've been working with them. There were people originally who we were like, no, we're, work we're moving forward with these. Uh, these potential tenants, and at this point, um, I think that the best the best chance of having a store in there and having a filling this vacancy is to move forward with Nilesh and Yashika. Um, and I mean, we receive letters from the town of Arlington all the time about it being vacant right now and asking why it's vacant and wanting to charge us money for it. And I don't like this is what we think is best for the town of Arlington is to put them in there. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else in the room before I turn back to Zoom? Thank you, Mr. Dickens. All right. Is there anybody else in Zoom who would like to contribute? We have a raise hand by Susanna Fuchera. Give a moment for uh, getting that person into Zoom. And 
uh, at this point, Susanna, you should be able to turn on your uh, my camera and microphone and unmute yourself. Good evening. Oh. All right, three uh, minutes, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go right ahead. Okay. Three All minutes. All right. Thank you very much. I've owned a condo at 230 Mass Avenue for 36 years. I'm reading this this time. My husband and I are strongly opposed to this proposal. First of all, there are already two stores selling alcohol, and he's selling it, and we've noticed. Mass Ave, Wine and Spirits at 137 Mass Avenue. That's, you know, within the Capitol Square um, blocks right here. And very, very close. And our neighborhood has a lot of shops, restaurants, a movie theater. We walk around the stretch of Mass Avenue on Saturday, Sunday, there are lots of families and small children. Number two, the narrow driveway into our parking lot for our condo building directly abuts the store in question. As it was, when that storefront was a dry cleaner's, we had numerous issues with our clients. Walking our driveway, parking their cars in our driveway, while people went in and out. And they closed at five. Package stores indicated a closing time at 11 p.m. Plus, the lights in the store will affect our residences late, late hour as well. Third, and more importantly, a more serious issue is that this address at the corner of Mass Avenue or Street is known to be dangerous, not only for drivers, but even more so for pedestrians. Ten years ago, a woman walking across Mass Avenue there and in the crosswalk was killed by a driver. At that time, it was noted that this particular crosswalk was the longest in the area without traffic signals, which are still not in a place at the location. The petitioners indicate they have a large number of positive votes from Arlington residents. If you look closer, however, it's a single short generic biased letter that people just have signed by petitioners as they walked by the store. A number of those who signed the letter live a significant distance away. They live as far as four or more miles away from our neighborhood. They're not abutters or close neighbors. Their decisions to support this establishment will have no impact on their daily lives. Also, monotony closed because the building is being torn down because um, the owners want to build a new building with apartments and retail. So they had to close. I don't know anything else about that. But let me just say, those of us living next door to or very close to this place, won't have the luxury that those other people who've signed that letter, we don't have that luxury to be so detached from this issue. It certainly will impact our way of life in East Arlington and in a negative way. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there further members of the public uh, attending on Zoom who would like to comment? If so, please raise your hand in Zoom. Okay, seeing none, um, one last chance for anybody else in the room. All right, this will end the uh, period of public comment. I'll invite the uh, attorney and the applicant back up, and we'll give them a moment to get settled again. Thank you for your flexibility on, on our limited uh, room logistics here. Take your time. We appreciate that. Um, okay. Uh, I appreciate everyone's comments. I will, uh, just as a matter of, of form, I, uh, before I turn to the board, I will give you the opportunity, I promise, to, to make any further comments or responses to the public. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we appreciate the input from uh, the neighbors and the stakeholders. Um, just a few brief clarification points. I mean, I, it does seem a little bit unfair to characterize 85 people who took the time to stop in front of the, in front of the location, support the store, discuss the store uh, as people that don't have a right to an opinion, that people are not, you know, neighbors who are close enough. I mean, you, you can look through the addresses yourself. There are some from right there, from, from right across the street, some from nearby streets, some from other parts of town. You know, that's the nature of retail. You don't serve only the people on your block. You, you, you serve the whole town and maybe even people from other towns. Um, secondly, the idea that this is going to cause light pollution shining into the building seems unlikely as the lights face the street. And uh, we have already uh, agreed that we will not be having the sort of plastered signs and neon beer signs of the lower end liquor stores. So I, I, I think hopefully that should not be a concern. Um, we do have an additional affidavit from 
uh, one of our consultants who spoke to Lieutenant Gallagher of the police department, who said there have been no calls regarding traffic or parking issues at the proposed location in the last two years. Uh, apparently there was a traffic stop outside the proposed location and a false 911 call that was reported in place from that address uh, at a time the store was closed. Um, so for what it's worth, the police department does not seem uh, especially concerned with the traffic issues right there. Um, uh, as to Mr. Fay, he was critical that we got support from only two neighboring stores, but not any others. Um, and I, I would have liked to have every store support us, but I do note that zero stores opposed us and two were in favor. So on balance, I see that as a positive. Uh, Mr. Patel and any liquor store or anyone in the wine or liquor business that can tell you that uh, wine tastings are an essential driver of wine sales. When you go to the wine store, or at least when I go to the wine store, there's a hundred kinds of red and a hundred kinds of white, and unless you're a big expert, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. That is why wine tastings are so important, and the idea that they sort of fade away over time, I think is without foundation and apparently without expertise from Mr. Fay. Um, as to Mr. Fiore and his cherry picking of our uh, various businesses, uh, first of all, we have 87 signatures in support now, just so the total is clear. Um, second of all, the Tewksbury store, the Boston store, and the Ware store are all currently approved and in permitting. So to say that those businesses don't exist is false. I mean, he, in Ware, he owns the building and the permits are at the building department. In Boston, the liquor license is approved. In Tewksbury, the liquor license is approved. We did not say these are stores that are up and running and selling cans of Bud Light. We said they have been approved because those towns deemed the character and fitness of the applicant to be strong and the public need for a license at the location to be strong. Um, the fact that one of the co-owners, their sister-in-law, who's providing some of the, fa the, the funds, lives in another state, does not make this not a family business. It's not, you know, they're not owned by a corporation in another state or country. This is their sister-in-law, Palak Patel. Um, so those are our rebuttals to those points at this point. Uh, and I would, I would like to mention that based on the address that Mr. Fiore gave, his, he's over a half mile away, so I don't know that he'd be considered a neighbor or a butter either. Thank you very much. All right. And thank you. And uh, if you would just um, say at the table, then I think at this point I'll invite, uh, turn to each board member and uh, invite questions. My suggestion would be uh, maybe a round of questions and, and answers. And then followed by perhaps a fresh round of just of just board only discussion with any, any motions, if that's acceptable to the board. So, Mr. Hurd? I just had comments. I don't necessarily have any questions. Okay, so. sure. Right. We'll go for uh, any, any members with questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank thank you for coming again this evening. I, I have a few questions. Um, and, and I, I, my memory of what Attorney Upton said at the last meeting was that the, the approval was granted in the other communities, not necessarily that the stores were open as well. And I know Tewksbury, there may have been an issue with the ABCC because of the lease that you have at the Tewksbury store that, that got sent back to the Board of Selectmen in Tewksbury because the units that you'll be occupying was incorrect in the lease. And it sounds like that's probably why you were delayed, but I, I know that has been approved. There is one thing from that application that I do have a question that does pertain to Arlington, and, and, and Mr. Fiore did bring that up, is, is just your wife's designation as a manager at both locations. And, and typically what we've seen is that if you have a manager, you might have one manager at each site because of the time uh, intensity that's required. And, and I, I have the Tewksbury application here with me, and, and uh, Yashika Patel is listed as a manager just same way as the revised, and I'm wondering, is there going to be a, a change to either one? Because it does seem unlikely that you'll be able to manage both, if, if approved. That, that is an excellent question, uh, and that is one of the few technical points on which Mr. Fiore may be correct. 
The ABCC requires, as part of the application, that you have a manager of record. And they require that manager to say that they're going to be on premises 35 hours or more per week. Typically, what applicants, whether they're liquor stores or restaurants or anyone else, you can't hire a manager four months before you open because no one would take the job and you wouldn't want to pay them for that. So you have to have an owner as sort of the placeholder manager who will oversee construction and the opening. Once that happens, uh, they will very likely hire a general manager who will then take the t eventually take the title of manager of record and we would come here and file a change of manager application. Okay, I didn't know that potential conflict there. Um, I want to go back and I have a few questions and I want to get into some of the factors as well, but just on what we have now through the revised application, I want to actually walk through what we had at the beginning and, and, and maybe before I do that, just we had some discussions about plans and, and the importance of plans and, and how we look at things. And as part of our application process, as you know, we, we state that every application must include um, certain information on a clear and accurate scale drawing. But we also have in our rules and regulations that the store layout shall not be changed without the submission of an amended floor plan to the board and the board's written approval. And so I'd ask Ms. Marr, if we go to the original application, um, and I believe it's page 13 of that application. I'm sorry for the delay, but I, I, oh, I think no, that's this, fine. Take, this, take your time. This is uh, important some clarification. Right, so. Or it might be the, the initial application itself, Ms. Wright. I believe it's page 13. No problem. Fine. Okay. Yeah, and you may have to do it. So, so this was the initial plan that was submitted. I believe it was produced in February. And, and if you increased and you go over to the right corner, uh, upper right, Keep going all the way over to the right, to the legend. Okay, so this is the project was a smoke shop and retail fit up. And within the floor plan, there's a humidor, um, which we had discussion about that at the last meeting. So if you don't mind going over to the left, Ms. Meyer, you can see the humidor there. But you also see along the left side, designated by A, is a series of glass cases, which I understand is consistent with the, the smoke shop type setup, um, and it, it, there's a number of other shelving. Now, this revised application that you submitted to us last week, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is the only two changes to that is that smoke shop was whited out in the far right on the legend, and humidor was changed to storage. Is that right? Yep. Okay. And the glass cases remain, and that the setup remains. And, and you said to us last time when you came before us that you heard from the community and you're changing the format around. And if I could ask Ms. Martin, I know this is um, asking you a lot, but you also presented a floor plan, different floor plan last time. And it seems now you're back to the original smoke shop retail fit up floor plan. And, and bear in mind, once you ask us to approve something, if you want to change it, you've got to come back to us. And so that's that's the revised. If you go to the package, I'll hold it up because it's it's this. That was the June one, yeah, page seven and eight. If you can enlarge that. Okay, and, it, and this was the basis for coming back. We said we have a different floor plan. We want to consider other things. Now, this is all wine and spirits and beer sales. And I'm just wondering what the thought process was going back to the initial smoke shop retail fit-up plan 
when you came to us and, and said, we heard from the, from the Board of Health, we're not going to do a smoke shop, here's what we have. This seems to be consistent with just a package store as opposed to um, you know, future use as a smoke shop. I'm just asking, why not this one in the revised application? Why go back to the one? Um, I, I don't see much of a use for glass cases in the, in the wine and in beer type sales um, situation. Right. Um, well, the, uh, we discussed this with the architect and the designer. And the build out, should the board grant a license, is estimated to cost between three and four hundred thousand dollars. So before we engage an architect and their outrageous fees and order materials and fit it out and design it, we want to show you what our plan is. Should the architect say, you can't have four of these rows, you can't have the glass cases, refrigeration can't connect to this side, we would have to work with you and the building department to make a change. Um, Mr. Patel told me that the glass cases could be repurposed for the better quality wines, so we left them in. They more like wine cellars. They, they, they'll be displayed as wine cellars instead of just glass shelving. And the, st the storage obviously now will be likely, possibly refrigerated, uh, but no longer dehumidified. Um, and, and, and just for what was brought before us in June, and you don't have to go back this far, I can hold it up. I, I don't know if that was your own drawing or if you went to No, an so this is a non-architect drawing. That was just hand sketched. Okay. This is an NFP scanned based off the exact measurement of the space. So what we actually put it in here is the actual measurements. Now, we can't go in front of the building uh, department until we actually have stamped drawings in front of you guys as well as the building department. So I needed more accuracy on, on just overall floor layout. That will get adjusted once we actually submit the building permit and application. They'll say this cannot be here or that cannot be here or the sprinkler head abuts this or the fire alarm system doesn't have a narrative or the sprinkler system. All these little adjustments happen before they give us a building permit. And that building permit gives us the, the power to go ahead and do a build out. So the adjustments on the plan will continuously happen until the building permit decides to give, building department decides to give us a permit based off narrative from the fire department, narrative for the fire uh, system, narrative for the sprinkler system, narrative for the walking cooler, uh, the framework, the insulation, uh, the lighting, and the, the equipment that goes in. All these things will be part of the build out process before we get issued a permit. So this is again, it's a preliminary drawing. It can't be finalized even if we want because we have to go in front of the building department before they can issue us a permit. Um, and, yeah, and, and, and I'd say, and we can get into this when we have comments, and yeah. you know, there's been a whole discussion here um, within, not a discussion, but, but just uh, from the memos that we've gotten from town department heads, yes. a building inspector in particular, talking about the timing. Did, did you go to the building department first? and then come to us afterwards. So I'll, I'll, I'll reserve comments on, on, on the differences here. So just one I will, thing. Oh, yeah, go ahead. One thing. And I have never seen a business go in front of a building department without having a permit ready to be applied to. So for instance, you wouldn't build a business without having a permit. So therefore, we wouldn't be able to go to a building permit, building department to get a building permit if we don't have a physical permit to operate that business. So the idea of this is to, for us to be able to get a, a permit approved under the, under the condition, conditions of getting building department approval. Once you get the building department approval, then we'll be able to move forward and do a build out. And now, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. No, no, yeah, yeah. please, please, sir. Mm -hmm. well, I, I was just gonna say, I mean, to, to be clear, we're, happy to work with any of the board's concerns about the layout. We're happy with, with the public safety, with the building department. But uh, we were directed to uh, apply with a clear and accurate scale drawing. That's the net floor area, the rooms, the storage rooms, the entrances, and the doors and windows. I mean, there's 
We added actually more detail, and we're certainly glad to discuss it, but the requirements of the application only ask for those things. They don't ask for the shelving and the glass and that stuff. And, you know, typically that does change based on availability or uh, building department issues and sometimes cost. Okay. And, and, and on this drawing here, and again, this may be down the road, but where, where's the cashier? Uh, or where would you, in this setup, where would the cash register be located? It would be on the left side where the glass shelving is okay. considered. So usually your your ID scanning system has to be at the entrance of where the customers can have an egress in and out. So right at the entrance, if you don't mind me getting up, customers walk in, they can walk around the shop as they cash out, the register system can be, and then they leave. Uh, and it also depends on the egress situation. But again, all these things will be determined when we go in front of a building department because they'll say, no, you need a, a, another exit uh, because of egress being an issue or you need more space, less furniture because handicap accessibility. So all these things will determine once we actually go into a building department. Okay. Um, if, I, if I may, I'm sorry. Please. I feel like I'm monopolizing the time here, but I got a, a, a couple of other questions. And Attorney Upton, you mentioned the various factors and the, the, the baller in case, if, it, if I'm pronouncing that properly um, talked about the factors that you look at with a liquor license. Yeah, I was actually going off uh, Attorney Himes' memo. Yeah, which, 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 which was which very cited the, the, the ball and very well. well. Yeah. Um, and as I look at that, I mean, the two that, that really concern me and want to ask you about is traffic and, and the, number of, the number of other stores in, in, in the area. But as far as traffic is concerned, and that goes to and, – and one other thing as well, which within our regulations – we do talk about that uh, the issuance of a package store license um, will contribute to the town's development in the following respects, providing convenient and attractive parking options. And I think you can see that there, there really are convenient and, and attractive parking options in this area, and, and you hope that things change based on what, what's in the memo here. But part of traffic is um, – or considerations – will be what happens when you get deliveries and how that's going to impact traffic. And I'm just wondering, how, how would deliveries be made to the store uh, after, after it's open and where would, where would delivery, uh, the de delivery trucks so park? The liquor company, liquor industry as a whole, majority of the delivery companies deliver before or, or during, before or during around the noon hours. So 9 a.m. to noon, that's usually your delivery time frame. Uh, during the time that time frame, uh, again, based off the egress, it could be decided where the delivery companies can actually deliver. Also, part of you know, uh, landlord discretion as well as the city's discretion of where and how we can do delivery systems. But um, it's never been the case for majority of the companies. They never actually had issues. Community stores get the same companies: HLA, J. Pollock, we use the same trucking systems. Liquor companies, same thing. They have the chain, same trucking system. Usually, is a rate liner that, that does deliveries for majority of the liquor companies. So, right. liquor, liquor companies typically use box trucks, yeah. as opposed to perhaps when the supermarket was there and they used semi trucks. I mean, a liquor store will have probably 20 to 25 percent of the SKUs that a, a small supermarket would have. So, the deliveries would actually be fewer than they had been historically. And usually, again, wine companies, uh, you don't really often buy wine on a weekly basis. The, the products that you buy on a weekly basis more is beer because of expiration dates. You can't store. Again, the space is not that large, so you're not storing huge amounts. But wine and liquor, you buy every two weeks, maybe every three weeks. So it's not a lot of traffic. Again, convenience store items, you need a weekly refurbishment because of uh, you know, short expiration dates. The only expiration dates here are more on the beer side. Okay. Um, just one more question, Mr. Chairman. This, this has to do on the, on the revised application. I see the notice of lease that is um, – that was attached. That was signed back in February. Has there been any amendment to that? The, the signed lease proposal, the lease proposal from Conway Real Estate, um, and it was signed by Mr. Patel, but that was signed back in February and it contemplated some things. Is, is that still what's in effect, or do you actually have a lease agreement now? No, no. It's a letter of intent. It's a letter of intent. Okay. 
And, and one of the things in there, maybe for both of you, and, and again, we're not the Zoning Board of Appeals. We don't deal with zoning, but there are definitely zoning issues with this property being in the R6 zone. Within the, the liquor license application, it was contemplated that you um, submit an application for a special permit, and then once you got the special permit, you'd come to the board here for a liquor license. And to my understanding, talking to the building inspector, uh, I don't think there's been any contact with the building inspector or with the ZBA or anything filed with them today. Is that right? Okay, maybe a question for you, Mr. Patel, and for the... No, that's correct. Okay. All right. I, I don't have anything further right now, and I'm sorry for the no. amount of time that I took. It, it was all productive time. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, may I, before we start, may I just point one thing out? Uh, sure. The, the building department said they have no objection to the issues of this license. Uh, provisions of the zoning bylaw may apply. So, I mean, our, our approach is to, if we get the license, obviously it would be conditioned either by you or automatically on any zoning relief. So it wouldn't, nothing can happen until they sign off one way or another. Mrs. Bond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. I've, I've been trying to sit and not keep asking all the questions all the time. So you cleared about 50% of time <laughs> on deck questions. Um, so I guess I'll sort of piggyback from where um, you, you left off there, which is that um, I, I don't know if this is a appropriate to the applicant necessarily or to the chair, through the chair, um, to Attorney Heim. I just want to make sure my procedural mind is, is running correct. As, as Mr. DeCourcy uh, pointed out that um, this applicant will have to appear before the Zoning Board of Appeals because I believe it's in R6 and um, the residential and minimal business use allowed by R6, this proposed business does not comply with that. And I know you're not ZBA, but am, am I close to correct on that, if that's all right, Mr. Hey, of course. Mr. Turnhead? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I think there would have to be a zoning determination made by the building inspector in his capacity as a zoning enforcement officer as to what exactly would be required, whether it should be treated as a prior non-conforming use or whether it would require a special permit. Um, the board has discretion to uh, grant a license contingent upon uh, obtaining that kind of relief. The board has discretion to consider that as part of its uh, overall decision-making process. Is that sufficient? And then am I correct that I'm, I'm just trying to, this is just a little bit different than some of the other, all of the other alcohol package store requests that, that I've heard. Um, and I've been here forever. God bless you all. Um, also, in, in concert with that, am, am I correct that the applicant also has to, because of um, environmental environmental concerns, environmental design review concerns, also has to go before the Arlington Redevelopment Board? Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes, please. Uh, Ms. Ma, that's a good question. Typically, if a special permit is required on Massachusetts Ave, that would go before the Arlington Redevelopment Board instead of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, it's important to note that there are some um, special permits that were historically granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals, and so they continue to hear permits that they sort of own historically. If it is a, a matter of, of prior nonconformance, according to the Zoning Enforcement Officer, and I'm not offering that opinion, I'm just saying that it's up to the Zoning Enforcement Officer, um, that wouldn't necessarily uh, go to the ARB itself, though certain aspects might have to go to the ARB with respect to, for example, signage uh, based on the environmental design review criteria. And just to be clear for everybody involved, uh, environmental design review is more or less a more thorough version of the zoning analysis for any special permit than the Zoning Board of Appeals, which typically handles more residential um, zoning matters. So uh, some of the things that we're talking about are receive a little bit more attention from the ARB than they do with the ZBA. And, um, and, and the reason, one of the reasons I raise this is um, our building commissioner has um, provided us that <clears throat> if this board issues this license and or when, um, it does say directly in there that this, our approval cannot be used for 
intended use for approval before both the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Redevelopment Board. So to me, that indicates those are two other boxes that need to be checked. And the only reason I raise this, and I, I could be um, concerned about something I shouldn't be concerned about, but especially around, um, I know there's environmental design review, but then there's also environmental concerns. And I know uh, previously where there was a, a dry cleaning uh, establishment that when another business went in there, there was um, something when they went through a review process, not a design review, but it may have come up from that. <laughs> um, just the nature of the dry cleaning business really kicked in some environmental costs that, that weren't included. So um, that's not anything that this board can um, necessarily weigh in on. Um, and I, I'm not going to ask Attorney Heim who he thinks would have to bear those costs, whether it's the... Uh, did you want to add something to that? Uh, that's all right, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. If I may, Th thank you, Ms. Mona. I thought I think that there might be one thing that would be help just the board in its consideration, uh, because as Ms. Mahans pointed out, this isn't a typical situation. Most of our uh, package stores, to my recollection, have gone into uh, spaces that were already zoned uh, for commercial explicitly in the bylaw. The way I would look at it is similar to the way your host community agreements work. You know, you were responsible for essentially deciding who was going to get a host community agreement under the criteria of that process, but that didn't entitle them to the relief that was necessary to open. They still had to go through a process to get a special permit under the zoning bylaw. So it's it's very much similar to that, and it's, I, I'm glad that you raised that because it's a good way of thinking about that, uh, with the one perhaps difference being that there's a little bit more allowance for some zoning consideration in um, the criteria that I've uh, sort of alluded to here. Thank you. And, and one last procedural question. Um, just if this comes up in the future. Um, I'm, so I'm of the opinion that when we're receiving applications like this, and unfortunately for the applicant and or uh, the owner, um, it's a two or three board commission involvement. To me, the natural course seems like, in light of the fact that we need to see as close as we can get to for final floor plans and if there is any uh, environmental design changes, things like that, that um, we should sort of be the last stop on um, the train that you all have to go through and you have to go to three different stops. <clears throat> so what this is making me think is, um, is it legally, is this something we need to redefine more uh, going forward? Uh, that if um, license, like licenses like this um, that involve the Zoning Board of Appeals and or Redevelopment Board, um, as well as the Building Department, um, do we need to work on something that sets up an order for the applicant where the select board, if not the last stop, is, is closer to the end? And, and I guess my question would be, it seems to me it's really ambiguous, so it's really unfortunately for the applicant to decide where they want to go first, which is usually the building department, and then they go from there. Um, so I guess my question would be to Attorney Hein through the chair is, um, because I feel the pain of, of the applicant for this or any, any other like application, um, I imagine, I'll just speak for myself, I think the select board should kind of be the last, if not the second to last, stop? Or does the, does the law say that's totally up to the purview of the applicant if they have to deal with two, three boards, commissions, et cetera, they can choose where they want to start and go from there? Well, in my opinion, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, Ms. Mahan. In my opinion, uh, it's there's not going to be a, a perfect process that you can outline that's going to cover every circumstance. In, this particular circumstance, we know that we consider location and, and zoning compliance as a factor um, in the calculus that the board engages in considering something. But I, I'm responsive to some of the things that the applicants are saying, which is that there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem here. And, and, and if they had gone to uh, building and um, the ARB first and sort of gotten a special permit approval for something that you ultimately 
didn't want to grant them or you didn't like a certain facet of the uh, layout, they'd then be going back to amend that special permit instead of trying to amend their alcohol license here. So I, I don't know that I have a perfect answer for that. I, I do think that our process, generally speaking, has worked very well for us. Um, as you've alluded to, I'm not sure that we've had a prior issue with respect to a, a pack store applicant not sort of having a clear uh, pathway in terms of zoning. That doesn't mean I'm saying these folks can't get the zoning relief that, that they would need. I'm just saying that I don't recall previous instances where either a special permit or confirmation of prior non-conforming zoning status was necessary in order to proceed. So long and short of it, I, I don't think that there is an easy way for us to sort of solve this specific problem, and I, I think it's a very fair and um, well-stated uh, perspective that, you know, you understand the bind that, that they're in as well as the bind that you're all in because we have a finite number of package store licenses. It would be difficult to issue a package store license on one hand when you're not sure that they're going to get the zoning relief. On the other hand, if they get the zoning relief and then they come in front of you and it's not um, to your liking and they get denied on the basis of what's been approved by the ARB or what the ARB would like to do, that would present a different kind of difficulty. So again, I, I think the best way to think about it is very similar to the way that your host community agreement process um, unfolded. These things are relevant. You're allowed to consider traffic. You're allowed to consider um, the other businesses. You're allowed to consider proximity. Um, the applicant. There's a lot of criteria that are still pretty much present here, uh, but I, I, I think we're going to live with a little bit of ambiguity with respect to um, having all those ducks lying in a row for zoning relief. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Okay, and then last two questions um, yes. to uh, Attorney Upton. So, so from what you uh, stated, I just want to make sure I heard it correctly that, um, and I understand uh, what you have to do sort of procedurally. So, so the intention is, is not to have um, Ms. Patel ultimately be the manager or general manager of the store. It's to get the construction going and then after that it will be a different individual. Did I hear that correctly or did I hear that incorrectly? Uh, no, I think you heard it correctly. I mean, depending on how long it takes to build, how long it takes to open, how long it takes to get up and running, I would say, I mean, it's her money, it's her life, it's what she wants to do to get these things going. Um, but if ultimately she's in charge of one or two or three, we're going to hire a person who's full time and change them to the manager, probably in the first or second quarter of opening. And I only say that because I was very impressed with her when I had the opportunity to speak with her on keeping good prayers for good, speedy health and recovery. Um, uh, so part of my decision is also based on uh, the representation uh, of her. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's a proposed 50% owner. Her sister-in-law is the other 50% owner right. who's more of a silent partner because she lives in another state. Um, so she, the buck stops with her. Right. No, no. I mean, in terms of who's going to be in there day to day, um, definitely have to be sold on her being there, but it sounds like she's not going to. Um, after the store opens and gets right, I, I, I wouldn't be too quick to draw that conclusion. She's not going to be there 40, 40 hours a week if we get another manager in the future. But to get it up and running and ultimately to supervise all aspects. She currently supervises all aspects of the cash flow, the bookkeeping, the personnel, the hiring and compliance for, for their other stores. Um, so that will undoubtedly continue. And as you probably know, in a retail business, if you're not there watching what's going on, it typically doesn't go that well. So she's going to be very, very hands-on. Since you say that, um, in my family, it's restaurant, but it also de deals with uh, alcohol. And some people know of the, the chateaus, um, which are pretty uh, prevalent throughout Massachusetts. I've been to the chateaus. You have about 12 choices, and you can also go to Nassara's and Duxbury's, but we won't get there. Um, uh, I, I know in, in that family structure that um, pretty much all the different uh, restaurants have a dedicated manager. They have a general manager, but then similar to the people who are putting the money out and have to see it, um, they really concentrate on one, two max, um, and it sounds here you're talking up to four. Um, 
So that that's yours and a business decision, but that does weigh on me in terms of, because, you know, I take representations from the microphone. Um, and then just lastly, just because Attorney Upton uh, raised the point in terms of your uh, closed circuit camera, um, is that a continuous 24-7, how long are the tapes retained? And if for some reason, as you uh, spoke about the uh, police, fire, or any other uh, department in Arlington are in need of that video uh, footage, is that something that the person on site can um, provide, or is it something, again, where the manager yep. isn't there? And there's a one, two, three, does it tape over? How, how long do you retain that? So two things. For the IT department, we own the IT company that manages all our database. We own the server, and the server holds one year worth of database for all our camera systems and all our establishments. Uh, second point, we are a family-owned business, and we micromanage our business. And that's one of the reasons why we have zero violations in any, in our, any of our businesses across the board. Uh, trust me when I tell you, we watch and see and control our business to the T as best as our ability. Uh, even if my wife is not there, she's there. Uh, in terms of controlling pricing structure, controlling uh, the, the, the compliance with ID checking, controlling the business operations, ordering, receiving, uh, accounts receivables, payables, the list goes on. Our managers are basically the forefront of operation of running the business, but the general manager overseeing the business is always going to be my wife. Anyone that any any business that she's operating. So, as, in terms of having a physical body, she's a mother. She's got to take care of her child. Um, she's not going to be there 24/7, but that doesn't mean that she can't own and operate a business. Um, and I will tell you, we have had great success because. Every one of my businesses ran family-owned, family-operated, and we are very much in control of our business from the point of sale to IT to uh, marketing to accounts receivables and payables and processing all the orders and the list goes on, hiring and firing. We don't have a general manager. We manage our managers on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, even in our house, we have in our office, we have cameras that's watching our businesses. Um, we have an IT team that's watching our businesses. I mentioned last, last time we were here that we hired a team of guys that basically operate our cameras and watch our establishments so that way we control the liabilities at best of our abilities. We were going above and beyond in just operations, so um, couldn't operate better. I, and I appreciate that answer, only because Years previous, a, a different establishment that we had mm -hmm. sort of fell into the model that you're not speaking about, but a different model where mm -hmm. um, there wasn't that oversight and continuity oh, yeah, and yeah. dedication to it. And we had quite a few violations out of that, and it really affected the neighborhood. So that's why I asked those questions. I'm not asking them just no, to No, no, no. It's, it's like I said, we, <laughs> we, we focus on the security because we know the most important factor of the business is security. If we have theft, we need security. If we have liabilities, we need security. That portion and the management as a general manager to manage the people that are operating the business is prime to, to any retail business. If you can't have that, you don't have a successful retail business, no matter how much money you put in, you'll get robbed left and right and you have issues left and right. And we know the liquor industry, we know the adult industry in, 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 in both categories, it's full control system. So um, there's no, you know, we have no record of having any issues because we operate very much in control. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dickens, do you have any questions? Um, I have no real questions for the applicant. I may have a question for Mr. Heim later on based on the sequencing. Okay. I just have one piece of um, advice maybe for, for the applicant if things go through, you know, based on the parking concern that we heard. Earlier, I mean, I think what the person who um, Susanna, um, or Suzanne, was referring to was when they had the the dry cleaner business there. I mean, that's when they were having parking issues. You know, not since it's been 
uh, empty. So I'll just suggest, you know, if it works out, me that when you do get customers, that you try to just emphasize to them me, that they don't block, you know, that driveway. It'll just make for a happier uh, neighbors. I know it's a little more to do, you know, but but it'll, it'll help because we having lived, you know, close to. I guess it was Giles or Giles at the time, you know, and uh, I mean, I would see you know, parking issues too, you know, I think your delivery um, situation might be a little easier than it was you know, on the other side of Mass Ave where there's just one lane, you know, going inbound, but, you know, the freight delivery parking is just a problem, period, you know, for just about everything, you know, it's just something that we have to work on, you know, as a town you know, and, and as a region, you know, and so, so, um, yeah, it's just it's something we have to work on, maybe micro deliveries or whatever, you know. So that's it, you know. Yeah. So, answer to your concern. Sure. Sorry. Uh, we completely understand. And one of the biggest things I've had in all the numerous businesses that, I, that we have that are based on pedestrian zone and traffic issues, signage is the biggest thing. Um, and it solved a lot of problems and providing strategic signage for parking and uh, restricted areas to not park, it, it solves huge problems. So that's one of the things we'll be working on. Thank you. Thanks. Um, at this point, I think we've, we've finished the public comment period. So um, I think we'll keep limit this, limit the discussion to the board and the applicant at this point. Um, all right, so now, um, I want to give the applicant and their attorney a, a final chance to raise any new points uh, before we, we sort of close this portion of the hearing and then just move to the board for its own internal uh, but yet public um, d discussion and motions. Is there anything uh, else that you wanted to briefly say to us? Uh, well, first I'd just like to thank the board for listening to this extensive application and process. Uh, the applicants put a lot of time and thought into this uh, and resources. and. Runs a good shop, is highly qualified, and a boutique wine store here ought to have a positive impact, especially with monotony now gone. Um, one minor point to make is I think there was some criticism of the name of the landlord. It's the Cronin family, but it's the Dioria Trust. Um, I believe that's uh, Mrs. Cronin's maiden name, so. Hopefully that criticism can be struck from the record. Um, but that being said, we appreciate your time. Thank you. I just realized I shorted myself and forgot to ask my questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice thing about being chair is I can fix that. Um, I recall in your opening remarks, Attorney Upton, that uh, the list of things you don't have are single, single, what would, for, formerly called NIPS, what was it called? Single, single serving single serving bottles. Line bottles. No lottery, no kegs, no malt liquor, no candy. Right. Uh, given that, would you be comfortable, should the board issue a license with a license that, that would um, restrict those uses, you know, the approval that would restrict those uses? A condition restriction. Condition, condition. thank you, yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we don't, we don't make those premise, promises yep. in an idle fashion. And frankly, one of the things that goes to public need and distinguishes us from Giles, for example, is that they focus on single service alcohol on cheap beers. I'm not sure if they sell kegs or not, uh, but that's not part of our customer base. And, and when you walk into that store and see lottery, tobacco, and single service bottles, that's the impression. As a matter of fact, I did walk into that store today, and this was the first thing I saw was the Nippa Fireball, which is the most popular uh, single serve alcohol in Massachusetts. Uh, which you can confirm independently because you see empty ones on the street all day long. Um, but yes, we're glad to accept that as a condition. Thank you. My other question is uh, about the signature gathering. I appreciate the affidavit. The affidavit. Now, when this was signed, um, Sarah said that that she did uh, thir about 35 signatures. So you, you know, you now submitted around 80. I guess my question is, did you collect uh, signatures from any other locations than other the immediate neighborhood? Of the store. Uh, no. So, so like, did did you did somebody go to other parts of town and and? Uh... Nope, nope. It was mostly in front of the store, on the block, across the street, down the street. You know, probably less than a third of a mile, half mile radius at most. 
Okay, so all the signatures were in what you would reasonably consider the neighborhood of the store. Right. I mean, our thought was... They, they, I understand that the dwelling, they might have been visiting from another part of town, but, but where the signatures were gathered. All right there. Yeah, no, we, we figured if we went to, you know, Penzi's or Jimmy's Steer House or something, no one would know what we're talking about. No. Okay, thank you. All right, those are all my questions. So um, thank you very much. Thank you for your, your closing remarks that preceded my final questions, and uh, I, think that, I think we can sort that out. So at this point, uh, certainly stay in the room and be available for any final questions the board may have, but I think I would turn now to my colleagues for, uh, for our own discussion only. Um, any comments, motions? Um, and I'd actually like to, to uh, start with Mr. Dickens. Yeah, I, have, I have a question for, for Snaheim. Could you, you compare this to the HCA process that we went through? But my impression with that was if we said no, that was end of game. And, um, it, um, it meaning that if we said no to, to a license, it didn't have a chance to go any further. It, uh, it, uh, is that the case here? So there's a sorry, Thank sorry. you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes. sorry. <laughs> yes, Mr. Stegan. So uh, in any alcohol license um, hearing, uh, if there's a denial, the applicant would have the right to appeal to the ABCC based on uh, the law that I've sort of summarized. You know, you sort of have to ar demonstrate that it's arbitrary or capricious decision. It's not grounded in evidence before the uh, select board. But um, – so there is an appeal mechanism in these cases. The HCA process is a lot more untested. Uh, is it possible? I, I didn't think so at the time, and I still think it would be a very tough road to hoe to try to force your way in to an HCA. So th that is a little bit distinct, yes. Yeah, and I'm sorry to discuss me. I think what we were getting at, I mean, this is what was getting at, it's just a matter of sequencing. It's like, who would he go to first? I mean, and so I mean, what I'm trying to understand is that other than the appeal process, I mean, I mean, if we were to say no, I mean, would they then have a chance to say, well, I mean, it wasn't really clear who we should go to first. I mean, so now we'll go to I an mean, ARB or ZDA. I mean, that's not that's not a possibility in this situation, right? If we say no, no, right, no. Okay. So, so yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Attorney. Hyde. Let me just be clear. Actually, in, in both circumstances, this is the body that decides substantively whether you think it's essentially a suitable business. I, I don't want the analogy to get to, to go too far. I'm just trying in terms of the sequencing piece right. of things and how some things are conditioned on zoning relief that later ends up vetting issues either at a different depth or in a slightly different way. This process is really oriented towards is this, uh, you know, ultimately a suitable business and the criteria here are want and appropriateness. They're, getting at the same thing, and this board is supposed to be the arbiter of that. You have a little bit more control in this situation than you have in an HCA. I just meant to illustrate that in the HCA situation, zoning relief is independent uh, predicate to opening, and that would probably be the case here as well. Gotcha. All right. Okay. You know, okay. well, you know I, mean, I am positively inclined, you know, towards me letting – the, make, give me approval. You know, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, certainly in, in light of I mean, the um, the owners, you know, I mean, um, their history with the college, you know, and and, um, and their efforts, I mean, um, yeah, I think they've made a really good effort, I mean, to find I me mean, a, a good, you know, um, I'm losing the word for it, a good company, for lack of a better word, to, to occupy the space. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, as I said, I mean, I mean traffic I mean, and deliveries I mean, are just issues, I mean, and, and we just need to get better I mean, as a town and as a region at handling them. But where there's a will, uh, there's a way, I mean, and, and we can work on that. You know? and, and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I mean, competition's good. You know, so so I mean, and, and I mean, they are on opposite parts, areas of the capital district. I mean, and so so it's not like you have two in one block. You know, uh, but I think having two uh, in in the area in which I live, you know, um, would be fine. You know, uh, and, um, and and I, I guess I'll just add to that. You know, I live in the area, but you probably won't see me in the store at all because me, I like. I do not have the enzyme that breaks down alcohol. I mean, so 
I just can't, you know, drink the stuff without getting really sick. So I'm not saying that because I really want another business that I'm going to uh, support, you know, but with my own money, but, but I can certainly support you as I think, I mean, uh, uh, I think you'll be, I think as a, 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 a company, you know, that would be good for the town, you know, so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, just a few comments. And I appreciate the presentation, you coming back here, and I appreciate the dilemma that the landlord is in in terms of finding a tenant. Unfortunately, with our rules and regulations and, and one of the goals to provide convenient and attractive parking and, and to take into traffic considerations, um, this has nothing to do with the business or the, 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 the reputation of the applicant or anything, it's just the site. And, and so I, I remain very concerned about the appropriateness of a liquor license at this location. And um, I'm, I'm leaning towards a no vote at this point, but I would like to hear from my, um, from my colleagues uh, at, 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 as well. And, and while it's not dispositive, the zoning of this parcel, it, 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 it makes it very challenging. I think it's probably what's made it so challenging for you in terms of whether you come to us first, whether you go to the ZBA first. It's a, a unique situation, but um, I've been involved in two other licenses. Both of the locations had parking on site, whether it was just for employees or whether it was for the public. And, and for me, that's an important consideration. The corner of Orbis and Mass Ave, um, it, it, it is a big concern with traffic and, and um, safety there for me. So. Yeah, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Do you remember what your comment was? Well, I was going to say, my first comment is sometimes these hearings are very difficult when you're rearing and getting the conversation, but you wait your turn. Um, I should assure you I do have the enzyme that breaks down alcohol. <laughs> you, you may see me. Um, for me, this is this comes down to a simple analysis of is the applicant appropriate, is the location appropriate. Um, I think I've been involved in two new liquor licenses, all packaged liquor stores, and I don't think either of the, to my recollection, neither had prior liquor store experience. They were both existing convenience store owners in Arlington which is a great business and they have good reputations. But um, I think the applicant in of the, the applications that we've had before, I don't think that any of them have been as sophisticated as this applicant and with the video cameras and a knowledge of ID systems and where our cash register should be in relation to the entrance when you're IDing. I think um, I am comfortable that the, this applicant could run a very successful liquor store business in town. I am not necessarily swayed either way by the fact that Ms. Patel is on two applications because I think we hear from applicants from time to time that everyone's going to be on site all the time and we've seen that in other stores and in restaurants and we don't go in with a clock to see exactly how much time each applicant puts in if someone wants to operate a business. We, the stores, whether it's restaurants or liquor stores that have failed in Arlington have been the, one that's, the ones that haven't had good oversight and have had violations and that's led to the failure of some of these locations. And I think it's on the applicant to make sure that systems are in place so you don't have violations. And I don't want to prejudge somebody um, before they have the opportunity to run a successful business. So again, and as far as timing, I think, you know, generally we have a process, but I think it's a strategy decision for the applicant when you have to get multiple approvals to say, you know, which one do we go through that might require the least amount of initial capital to, and decide this is the one that we need, that we want to go f first because then this is a difficult one or whatnot. So I think that's just a decision on the applicant's front. I don't think there's anything, any reason to deny this just based on the fact that they came here before the ZBA. I think the applicant knows you have a tough road ahead as far as zoning. Um, but for us, again, it's just does the application, is the applicant a 
appropriate? Is the location appropriate? So I am fine with the applicant and what the applicant has put before us as far as security controls and experience. Um, location, I think, Mr. Corsi, we'd love to have businesses all around town that had parking, but I mean, it's not necessarily true, um, and not to take away from the severity of the point. I, it almost, some of the objections seem to be that this business might be too successful. Um, we have a storefront, it's empty. We want to put a business in there, we want to have a business that's successful. Um, you know, no matter who the business is, a, a lot of the traffic concerns, I think, would be present with other businesses. And there are some that might not have deliveries, but up and down Mass Ave, we have a lot of stores that get de deliveries. We have restaurants that get deliveries, convenience stores that get deliveries. You know, loading zones have been difficult in Arlington, but um, to Mr. Diggins's point, as opposed to the store across the street, where it's one lane, this does have two lanes. Um, I think in that business, they figure it out. It's downtown Boston gets deliveries. And that there's not necessarily a lot of space for trucks there. I know one of the biggest issues we've had in Arlington Center is the Starbucks semi truck. Starbucks materials get dropped off in a semi truck that's parked in front of the Capitol Theater. We figure it out. Um, as far as proximity, when these liquor licenses came out, and Mrs. Mahan can correct me, but I think initially there were three, and the plan was to have one in our, divided the town to Arlington, East Arlington, the center, and the Heights. So now we have seven. With If we still divide into those three zones, that would put two in one, two in one, and three in the other. Town meeting gave us three licenses to fill. So I'm not necessarily swayed that there's two other liquor stores around. I know you know, monotony beer and wine is up in the air whether you say it's coming back or not. Um, I think the proximity to the other liquor store on, on Mass Ave has been a little bit overstated. I mean, it is three or four blocks down, it's across the street. So I don't necessarily think that that being, you know, that, that far away. I mean, we're, it's really on the outskirts to call them both in the Capitol Square District, but I, again, I don't think that that is prohibitive for this store. Um, I think the layout is fine. I think the layout will get reworked, like as the attorney mentioned. If this changes, then they have to come back to us to approve the changes. So um, for me, I'm okay with the application. Uh, like Mrs. Higgins, I'm inclined to support it. I mean, I think the liquor license exists. We created the liquor license. There hasn't been a demand for it every time we put a liquor license out. I think we get one applicant max when we advertise it, that we're going to be putting a liquor license out. So, And we do have a family-owned property that's been in family for a long time, and it is a struggle for commercial landlords to, this has been a, discuss, a separate discussion for years, empty storefronts. And as Mr. Cronin mentioned, we're in a process of finding storefronts that don't have, that don't fill their spaces. And I think we've realized that that's, it's not so simple as to just go to a landlord and say they drop somebody in your business or else we're going to find you X dollars a month. Um, I would like to see as many businesses as we can in, in town, as many storefronts as we can filled. And so I don't think, I mean, if you have a, a business and a landlord that feel like they have a relationship that will mesh, I, I don't think that, again, is prohibitive of, of why we should approve the license. So to me, I am fine with this application, the applicant, um, and I would be happy to support a motion to approve it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know if I can take advantage of you in this way, but um, one of the Let's things <laughs> yeah, one of the things that uh, I see as a, a big positive is you had uh, 
noted what Attorney Upton said in the beginning about three or four things, single use, mm -hmm. they, they would agree to certain conditions. Right. Do you yeah. still have that list or no? Yep, uh, single use, uh, other, uh, otherwise known as NIPS, lottery, kegs, malt liquor, and candy. And I think I heard from Attorney Upton that, that uh, in uh, Mr. Patel that that yeah. would be, be agreeable, condi yeah. acceptable yes. and agreeable conditions on the um, license. And I, uh, I understand the dilemma right now of the six um, liquor stores that we have in town. Four of them have a parking lot, is what I'll call it. Um, uh, two of them don't. One's the one in East Arlington on Mass Ave and the one in the Heights by Foot of the Rocks. Uh, they mostly depend on, uh, although the one in the Heights may have employee parking in the back, but I'm, in terms of um, public parking, but Summer Street, Mystic Wine, um, the uh, convenience store, as well as the one on Broadway, those do have a dedicated parking area. And that's always something that we have to s sort of uh, go back and forth on. Um, in terms of uh, applicants who have to appear before us and possibly one or two other boards, that's not something, um, and I understand for the applicant to bear that. Um, issue and uh, uh, further define it so maybe as we have conversations in a different form moving forward and maybe there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, it, it just has to be um, sometimes we're first, second or third. Um, but I think for me, um, I'm, I'm, I am concerned about the parking but that would apply to a lot uh, of businesses here in Arlington and I, I, I do understand that um, we're moving forward uh, trying to encourage uh, not just vehicular, but not just pedestrian, but other modes of transportation, um, hopefully to help uh, make the town safer as well as revitalize some of our businesses. So for me, with the, the list of conditions there, um, I, I would be comfortable uh, approving this license. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll speak to my own views. I think I'm with Mr. DeCourcy on, on, and probably I'm no on this, but, um, but appreciative of a motion, because I think I'm counting the votes correctly, that, we, that there's enough to, to board this. Um, would certainly um, appreciate that motion that would have the, the conditions. Um, you know, my concerns are, are really just nothing at all about the applicant, but suitability to the neighborhood and to the, to the location. I think the, the, uh, the best use of this uh, property. I think with regard to uh, resident input. I don't discount the input that and, and the, the form letters that were gathered um, by, by the applicants, but I think that there's you know there's quant quantity and then there's quality, and I, I think I'm very uh, moved by the quality of the individually expressed um, views of, of people from the neighborhood. Um, I share Mr. DeCourcy's concerns um, uh, along the other things, so I won't, I won't repeat those. Um, so. Um, but, but that said, I think we've all sort of declared ourselves, and uh, I would welcome a motion at this point. Well, I'll make the motion to um, approve the um, application subject to the conditions being uh, uh, no single serve, a, uh, no, no um, candy, a, uh, no lottery sales, uh, no tobacco. What else? <coughs> How do you think about cakes and malt liquor? Oh, cakes and malt liquor. Cakes and malt liquor. <coughs> Yeah, okay. That's it. Oh. That's my list. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not inclined to add anything else to that. So, Mr. Hines. Mr. Attorney Hines, did you have any advice? I, I would be curious, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, please. If the applicants have uh, some sense of an agreed upon time frame to try to get that zoning relief so that we're not sitting in limbo for a long mm. period of time and their interests and our interests, you know, um, a, a sort of Obviously, alcohol licenses are subject to renewal every year, so um, maybe that's I, the way that they would propose to deal with it, but I think it would be helpful for the board to have some sense of when are you going to uh, apply for the zoning relief or sort that out, and you know how long do you think you need to um, try to uh, uh, arrange for that? Yeah, I'll use my prerogative to, to invite that answer. Uh, Attorney Upton? If, if, if the board is uh, willing to grant this license today, uh, then the town has to send it to the ABCC, which typically takes anywhere between four and 12 weeks for them to do their process and send it back. 
but we would commit to engaging. We, we have engaged Zoning and Real Estate Council, and we will direct and activate him and her. It's a team uh, tomorrow morning. Mr. Chair, may, may, is, there, yeah, yeah. is there a time yeah, frame that you folks might agree upon that, you know, to try to get a decision out of? I mean, I understand that the ZBA or the ARB shouldn't be locked into a specific time frame, but do you have Right. I mean, we're, we're glad to complete the application and send it in and we'll appear as soon as they'll hear us. Okay. I'm not familiar with their calendar, but we're, re we're ready to go. Yeah, and turning I think you're, you're, you're suggesting that the board may want to contemplate um, Putting into the into the approval a time frame for the completion of the of, this, of the curing the zoning potential zoning issues. I guess I would say at least um, uh, putting in an application for the zoning relief should that be necessary. Putting, I'm sorry, putting in a, putting in an application for the zoning relief yeah. um, okay. necessary uh, if it's as, as a condition. Four to twelve weeks from the for the ABCC. Um, it's a longer time frame, but um, maybe within six months of this decision if that sounds reasonable for you to put in your application yeah no, I mean that that's fine I mean as I said we'll we'll activate the uh, zoning council tomorrow and I mean I don't know how complex it is to file for this but it, I mean it should be it shouldn't be six months by any stretch we'll we'll, we'll start now so um, mr. Diggins would you be open to expanding your motion to, to put the uh, six months uh, on, on applying for the zoning relief? Of course. Yes. So we have that amendment. From yes. Um, so I believe I still need a second? Second. <coughs> right. Any further comments or discussion from the board? Okay. On a motion by Mr. Diggins and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Uh, no. That is a 3 2 vote in favor. Congratulations. Thank you for your patience. Thank we you. appreciate it. Right. Thank you, Ms. Cronin. Doria Cronin. Formerly. Thanks, thanks, thanks to all who came a second time to, uh, to appear due to my procedural uh, glitches. Uh, I'm going to check in with the board. Does anyone need a, a, a brief recess before we proceed? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's move on to open forum. So um, it's, it's there, so we'll do it. <laughs> Except in unusual circumstances, any member presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted on nor decision made in the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a time limit to present a concern or request of three minutes. So. Um, do we have any uh, people in, in Zoom? Please raise your hand, or in the room, please raise your hand if you want to comment under open forum this evening. All right. Seeing none, move on to item 10. Approval. Signage and traffic rules and orders amendment for electric bus and vehicle charging stations at Audison Middle School. And I am delighted to welcome to, uh, in, in succession here, uh, long-suffering and, and, I have to say, star employees of our, of our planning department here who have been uh, patient but also done, in my view, some really excellent preparatory work for this evening. So I will turn it over to you, Ms. Fox, if you please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Talia Fox. I'm the Sustainability Manager for the town. Thanks to the members of the Select Board for the opportunity to present to you this evening. Um, I believe I do have a slide presentation um, I'm here to share some updates on Arlington's electric school bus project and present requests for parking restrictions and modifications to the traffic rules and orders. Um, I want to note that previous versions of the presentation that you may have seen incorrectly stated that the request was for a bylaw modification. I'm aware that that is incorrect and want to affirm that it is indeed for modifications to the traffic rules and orders before I proceed. So first, just for some project background, as you know, we have a net zero action plan. That plan commits the town to purchasing only zero emission vehicles by 2030 as a priority action in pursuit of our goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We are getting a head start on this priority action and focusing on school buses for two key reasons. One is that they directly support student health by improving air quality for students on and around the bus, which certainly is welcome in these smoky times. <laughs> There is also ample funding for electric school buses right now. 
And in 2021, the town did secure both federal and state funds for two electric school buses and two direct current fast charging stations to charge those buses. I'll just note that this was before my time with the town. I started in January of 2022. So there are some details of this project that I, I will try to speak to based on my conversations with my predecessor and Deputy Town Manager Jim Feeney. But I'll, there may be some things that I have to check on as well. For a bit more detail, uh, next slide, please. In addition to the two electric school buses to replace two diesel buses in the fleet and two fast, fast chargers, the project includes two level two chargers, which are for school personnel use during the day and public use outside of school hours. The chargers will be sited at Audison Middle School in the lower parking lot, which was decided after consideration of a few other sites, as I understand it. Most notably, the project team considered the lot of the St. Famillus Parish where the town currently rents land to store the buses, but there was a concern around investing in infrastructure on rented land. The next slide shows a diagram of where in the Audison lower parking lot the chargers will sit. The fast charging dispensers have actually already been installed, and the level, level two dispensers will be built and installed in the coming months. The first request to the select board is for approval of parking restrictions for these spots and corresponding signage. For the fast chargers, R7 series signage from the manual on uniform traffic control devices or MUTCD would be adapted to limit parking to the buses and indicate that all other vehicles parked in these spots are at risk of being towed. For the public level two chargers, R7 MUTCD signage would be used to indicate that vehicles parked in these spots should be actively charging and indicate that all other vehicles are, are at risk of being towed. As the next slide shows, this type of signage is used for other level two town owned chargers. The signage for the chargers at Audison will in fact look identical to the signage just recently installed for the stations at Schuler Court by the high school, which is pictured here on the right. The second request to the board is for the modification of the town's traffic rules and orders, section 15D, to enable enforcement of these restrictions. The purpose of proposed section 15D paragraph G is to enable Arlington police to ticket or tow members of the public who are not school personnel who park in the designated charging station spaces during school hours. This amendment would apply to the new level two stations at the Audison Middle School and it would also apply to the stations that are already located at the high school in Schuler Court and at the Gibbs School. Currently, for these stations, the policy is that only school personnel are permitted to use the stations during school hours. Access during school hours is controlled with a code provided to school personnel only. But that code is not a sufficient way to ensure that the stations remain available for staff. This amendment makes violations enforceable to preserve this charging benefit for school personnel. And I'll note that this was introduced in consultation with Officer Corey Ratto with the Arlington Police Department. The purpose of paragraph H is to enable the Arlington Police to ticket or tow members of the public who park in the spots designated for the electric school buses at Audison Middle School. This would ensure that the spots are available at all times for the buses to charge so they can safely and quickly get students where they need to go. Should signage and amendments be approved? An immediate next step, next slide please. We'll be manufacturing the signs, ideally in the next few weeks. We are waiting for a final piece of electrical infrastructure to be delivered, which should enable the utility to energize the charging stations, ideally in August. I'll note that this part of the project, just so the board is aware, has been delayed, unfortunately, for approximately nine months due to supply chain issues. So we're hopeful that by September, we will be able to start using the electric school buses and have a ribbon cutting event on town day we will alert the board once plans for the ribbon cutting are finalized. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the board this evening, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is uh, Ms. Mahan. <laughs> Mrs. Mahan, third time's a charm. That's okay. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, move approval. Um, second, uh, it's okay if you don't know the answer to these questions. It's m more for my edification. And I live, I can see, when I was speaking with Mr. Um, Alessi the other day, I told him exactly where I lived, which is right behind the Audison. Uh, approximately how long does it take for the um, DC chargers for the buses? Do you know how long that takes to charge? Yes. Um, and actually, my follow-up question yeah. is, Sorry. what if those two DC chargers for the buses, not for um, 
the other two, um, inexplicably um, weren't usable. Uh, I assume the backup plan is, I guess it's dependent on how long it takes to charge these buses, and the backup plan is if those two buses can't charge up at the Audison, they'll go down to the high school or down to the yard, public yard. If I could, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Yes, please. Um, so the time to charge the, the buses, and I actually have a slide on this for reference um, with some other bus statistics if you want to take a look at those in the deck, but it's about two to four hours. Um, as for if they're unable to charge, uh, we do have a partnership with other charging stations in town, so we actually were trying to use the buses uh, a few months back um, because we actually have had the buses for about a year now. The, the chargers have delayed the whole project um, which has been really unfortunate. So we were actually able to charge at a nearby car dealership. Unfortunately, the town's level two chargers um, are not compatible with um, the bus engines, which is an unfortunate discovery that I think in retrospect, we would have liked to put in the bid to ensure that compatibility. Um, we do have uh, you know, a warranty um, and we have service available for the chargers should anything go awry. Um, but I think, uh, if, if a backup plan beyond that is um, something that is um, something that the, the board wants us to have, I can speak with um, the school department about that. And then the um, level two chargers. Oh yes. During school hours, school personnel, school vehicles. Mm -hmm. But am, am I correct that outside of that, so non-school hours after whatever the time is, five, seven, nine, and or weekends, on the level two, not the, the bus, um, those are available to the public? That's correct. And it, is it the same in terms of how long it takes to charge an electric car, approximately one to two hours? So um, the distinction here is between, oh, sorry. I, yeah, these talks. <laughs> um, this distinction here is between um, a level two charger and a level three charger or a direct current fast charger. The bus chargers are this direct current level three fast charger, and so they have a quicker charge because they provide more current um, and more power to, to the engine, or to the battery, rather. Um, the level two chargers have less uh, power going to the batteries, so the charge time will vary based on the size of the battery of the vehicle. Um, if you had about a 40 kilowatt hour capacity battery, um, which is the uh, roughly what, what sort of a typical passenger vehicle would be, um, I believe the charge time is somewhere between five and eight hours, um, um, but again, it sort of varies. Um, I believe our level two chargers are charge point brand and they have um, about a seven kilowatt uh, capacity. So it's about five and 5.8 or something like that. Hours. Thank you. Now, honest to goodness, wanted to know that because I can definitely see um, not on the DC charger, but on the level two, ch level two chargers, um, residents on those non-school hours, availing them of the opportunity um, to use that. And as far as if for some reason that happens and it goes into school hours, I'm assuming a tow is a tow is a tow, but you have to unplug the car. But I'll leave that to if for some reason we need to tow one of those. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if I, if I may add. Um, of course, Ms. Fox. Um, that often when folks are charging, they're not at zero, right? So it might, the time for both the buses, I'll say, and also for a passenger vehicle um, might be slightly less than that because you're you're not necessarily getting down to a fully empty tank. Um, tank. So Have speak. you met me? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, depending. No, I don't. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Hurd. Thank you. I'll second the motion. Um, just a quick question on the if you can see it instead of pulling pull it back up. Isn't there two entrances to this parking lot? There are currently two entrances to the parking lot. Is area. that to scale? Uh, the, as far as how big a bus would be in that space? So that is, it, it is not to scale. I, I created it and it's not to yeah. scale. But um, well, I, I guess do my, under, my I, only, I do, yeah. um, sorry. Please. No, no, good. Uh, <laughs> you can probably anticipate my question. Um, it looks like if there was a, two bu a bus there and a car there, we're essentially blocking the entrance. I guess my question is, is it necessary to take that spot space out too? Or when a bus is parked in there, would I guess it would just be silly to create a situation where a bus 
kind of blocks the way if, if the car and, and again I'm happy to support it uh, my only question is would it be necessary to take this space out to allow people to get in and out of the parking lot my understanding is that it would block the, the two buses would block the entrance to the parking lot um, that's as I understood the project as conceptualized was always the intent is that when the buses are parked there um, no one would be able to enter through that uh, through that entrance um, as for whether it would my understanding is it wouldn't block that space it wouldn't prevent someone from parking in that space on the side um, but it would block the entrance to that that closer or it would block that closer entrance um, and I am happy to go back and create a uh, to scale diagram of, of how large the, the buses, the, the size of the buses would you know, take up in that space. Yeah, I, I don't want you to make, make you have to do more work than, than, than uh, is necessary. I, I'm just looking at if, again, I'm not contemplating not allowing the bus um, charging stations, just whether or not that parking space is going to ca cause a problem. is. Even if you say, all right, can't use that entrance there because the bus is blocking it, I wonder if a car could back out of that closest charging sp space or back out of, I just don't know if there's enough swing there. So, I, I mean, I guess it's an engineering pro problem that they'll deal with once it's put into place. But it just seems to me that if there's two buses there, there's going to be some issues with cars getting in and out of the spaces that are both right next to the buses and those two spaces of, at the bottom just to swing a car in and out. Get a little Austin Powers action. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. right. Any other comments? Questions? Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Fox, for the uh, presentation. And it's a question that the charges the buses are only going to be there when they're charging, right? They're not going to be parked there overnight. They're, that will be, I don't know if they're up at St. Camillus or if they're, they'll be down at the, at the high school when they're fully charged, if you, if you know. My understanding is that they would only be there when charging, but I, I would like to confirm with um, Steve Angelo, the, the fleet manager. Okay, so I'm, yeah. happy, I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and I certainly support the charges. I, I, Mr. Hurd makes a good point on where the buses are, and I will say in the winter, uh, of course we can't see it from the overhead, that's a pretty good incline into that lot, and it's, it's, it, that can get really icy. And I don't know, you know, when the buses are going at a slow speed, whether that's gonna be a problem in terms of moving them a lot, because having um, been involved in a lot of programming up at the Audison on weekends in the winters, I've seen cars slide all over the place in that lot. So it's, it's I'm, I know there was, this was the best location that was selected, and I think there was others that were rejected, and as I said, I'm happy to support it, but um, I, I almost feel like, is there a way to check? Go back and, and see where any other locations, I don't know why others were, weren't deemed feasible, but clearly we need a couple charges, but once you do the drawings to scale, if you see this is gonna be a little bit more difficult, maybe, maybe we need to select someplace else, but for now, I'm happy to support it. I'm happy to support it. I just have curiosity questions, but it's 924, so I'm not going to ask them. Yeah. Um, I have, I'm going to channel Mrs. Mahan here and ask a couple of technical questions uh, that may, may be moot. And uh, Attorney High, this is your uh, heads up. Um, on the recommended changes to the, um, to the parking regulations, uh, there's two statements that say violation of this regulation could result in the vehicle being ticketed or towed. Would it be better if it said may result? instead of could result in what I'm thinking of is to make it clear that the town has the authority to do that. Or if it doesn't matter, that's fine. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that if you feel it's clear to say may, then let's say may. That's a very diplomatic response, Mr. Attorney Hyde. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, would, um, let's see, uh, Ms. Mahan, would you be comfortable with uh, making that pretty much? Yeah. All right, any other discussion? So on a motion uh, by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, five nothing in favor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for staying tonight.
think it sounds like a scoreboard. Yeah, it does sound like a scoreboard. Yeah, it's heavy quoting once Red Sox scores before the <laughs> night's out. All right, Blue Bike Station expansion number eleven, Mr. Alessa, you're up. Also, thank you for saying. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's our thirteen in this building right now. <laughs> um, and thank you, members of the select board, for having me this evening. My name is John Alessi, Senior Transportation Planner in the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, I'm here tonight to request the approval to install two new blue bike stations here in Arlington. The first on Bill Street at the Miniman Bikeway Crossing, the second at Arlington High School on Mass Ave. So these locations were determined based on a resident survey released by my office in spring 2022. These were the top two locations requested by residents. The first on Mill Street will be on street. There would be no impact to parking regulations because there's currently no parking allowed in that area. And the second location at Arlington High School would involve, would require the removal of two on-street parking spaces. However, the location is directly adjacent to the CVS parking lot, which has 70 spaces. So our office felt that there would be minimal impact to parking availability in the vicinity. I have consulted with the Arlington Police Department and the Department of Public Works to ensure that there wouldn't be any negative impacts to traffic operations, public safety. They don't foresee any potential negative impacts. And um, if implemented, this will increase the number of stations in Arlington from six to eight, which will help fulfill first last mile transit solutions and increase availability of um, access to recreation and open spaces. So with that being said, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Olson. And I'll turn to the board. Mr. Dickens. Sure. So I'm happy to make a motion to approve this, and then I have a, a couple questions. Sure. Yeah. So um, on at CVS um, station, mm -hmm. you know, I see that there's a space for one compact vehicle. Mm -hmm. and, um, a, I'm thinking that it might be um, a good idea to put bike racks there instead of the um, hmm. compact parking space because we, I think probably what you'll find is that, you know, cars that aren't so compact will end up trying to park there, which could probably those problems, you know, uh, for that nearby driveway. Also, I mean, I just hear, I mean, um, a lot of people asking for more bike racks, you know, I mean, uh, and so, so I just put that out there as a suggestion, you know, and then my, my, my other um, question, my, my, only, my only question actually is, so uh, these are mobile stations can be taken out during wintertime. So in this case, me, um, what would happen to those spaces in wintertime? They would be made available again for the um, two-hour parking. Okay, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll second Mr. Diggins' motion, and I uh, want to thank you, Mr. Lassie, for the presentation tonight, but also the information you provided to, to, uh, to me prior to the meeting. Uh, just one comment, and, and this may be a comment to, to directed towards Attorney Heim for future, uh, for the future. I, I'm happy to support the Blue Bike Station on Mill Street. As I look at the aerial and as we discussed last week, to me, the, the better spot there is, is along the bikeway. Um, and I know that's within the MBTA right of way. And, and since I've been on the board and since I've been in town, I've been told over and over again it's hard to deal with the MBTA with the right of way. And I think this is the type of thing where, uh, you know, I'd like to work through uh, Attorney Heim and, and perhaps Mr. Diggins too with the MBTA and say, this makes perfect sense. There's plenty of room on either side of that bikeway to move the blue bikes. Um, can we cut through the red tape and do it? Because it's, as you're coming down the bikeway, and I walked down there over the weekend, there's a lot of room there. And um, it, it just would eliminate some concerns at Mill Street, but for now, happy to approve it, but maybe I could ask Attorney Heim, what can we do when, about right-of-way issues with the MBTA? Because it seems to be a constant obstacle. Attorney Heim. Yeah, just to, I, I, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Corsi, I couldn't agree more. Um, while the MBTA is a wonderful partner in many, many, many ways, um, their sort of management of real estate is sort of half exported or farmed out and half sort of maintained in-house. Um, I'll try to maybe see if I can mine some contacts for ways to approach it in a different way. But uh, their, my understanding of their position, understanding I don't represent them, is they're just very reticent to grant any property rights within their 
uh, right of way and that their overall perspective is that they've granted this license for the bike path and we sort of administer it. But um, we've seen in a few interesting instances some real reticence and even some aggressiveness in terms of asserting their rights relative to private property owners who have tried to make what is otherwise pretty sensible uses of some of this. So I, I, I welcome that, uh, that direction and that challenge and these folks can help me make some headway that I haven't made before. Thank you. Yeah, um, Mr. Diggins? It was just in response to it. Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. So, um, so the, I'll be happy to work with you on that. And Mr. Heim, I, mean, I did talk up. Uh, I, I, I made a little progress I mean, uh, I mean, about six months ago. I mean, uh, and it was going through the advisory board. I mean, uh, and there's a reason for why I mean, when it stalled, I didn't push. You know, uh, uh, man, but this is another you know, vehicle. Pun intended you know, for, 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 for making that push me. So if Mr. Force gave me my plus one on this, you know, we can work with Mr. Hyman and then report that. <laughs> report the board. Three musketeers, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hurt. Thank you for the presentation and also taking the time to walk me through this before. I'm mean, happy to support it. I think there's definitely a need for more a demand and need for more blue bike stations. Had similar comments about the location at Mill Street. My only concern about the location is, you know, visibility of, of cyclists and pedestrians coming out of the bike path. But I think that's minor and can be handled. But long term, that is certainly a better location. So happy to support it. Thank you. Mrs. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, definitely happy to support this. It, as well as the opportunity to meet with Mr. Lassie, and I just want to sort of codify or memorialize the conversation you and I had uh, on the uh, blue bike in front of the high school, which is very close to and or abuts the very used crosswalk um, by student staffs, staff and, and other people, residents. One of the things I was concerned about that I raised with you, and you actually had a very good retort back to it, is Sometimes um, with the blue bikes um, at either end or both end, um, they put up really tall uh, sort of advertisements or just the structure of it and where that is, especially uh, we all know high school students, earbuds, cell phones, they see a crosswalk, I'm safe, I go. And I was, I was concerned about that in terms of being a visual impediment, but I think you had a, a proper response to that. If I may, Mr. Chair, please. Um, thank you. Um, I forgot to mention that earlier, so thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yes, so the stations usually come with an advertisement panel that, pretty tall, it can obstruct the visibility of those using the crosswalks at both locations. Um, so yes, I'm going to request that when Blue Bikes, if approved, if Blue Bikes installs the locations, that they do not include the advertisement panel so that there are no um, obstructions to those crossing at the crosswalks. And I was also concerned about Mill Street, but definitely the one at the high school. That yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wesson. Thank you. And I'm also delighted to support this. So, for the discussion, we have a motion from Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed is 5 0 vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Moving on to item 12. Um, we will now recall that we have a town manager joining us remotely, and thank you, for, sir, for your patience. Uh, this is the update on the ARPA budget, budget, and we have Mr. Sandy Pooler, town manager. And uh, Ms. Ms. Marr is preparing to uh, put the budget table up on the, up on the screen. Yeah, for the folks thank you very much. Sorry, Sandy. <laughs> so I'm going to get it. Bigger, or, or is that yeah. what we're going to see? No. no, no, I'm trying to move it. It's half on the screen, half on the screen. Here we go. That's not what I need, but it's stuck. Okay. Well, you were, but there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, board members. Uh, so what you have in front of you is a 
compilation of our ARPA spending through fiscal year 23. Uh, after FY23, we have about another year and a half of spending that's on the table. But I thought tonight what we wanted to do was to just show you what we've actually expended to date, some of the progress that we've made, um, and give you some sense of uh, how much money is then left from, from this. Um, I had thought that originally I might make a presentation tonight making future recommendations about spending, but uh, as we've gone through putting this together and various other things that have been going on in the office, I think it's probably best that uh, the next town manager make those recommendations to you. So tonight, um, I just want to go through this list uh, and just give you a sense of the, uh, the totals here and answer any specific questions you have about some of these allocations. Um, so I'm just going to highlight uh, particularly some of the big items here. As you see in the sheet, for revenue loss, we have so far actually spent um, $5 million of our uh, $35 million of ARPA allocations uh, on the FY23 budget. During the uh, town meeting this spring, town meeting voted another $5 million to be uh, used for the FY24 budget. So uh, all in all, we will have used up $10 million, but uh, what these sheets show is just to date, $5 million has actually been spent. Um, for various things on public health, uh, we, excuse me, uh, we have spent 370 of the 536, so there will be uh, some money left over there. Um, equity and inclusion, uh, well, I guess I would say for all of these things, we've made progress on all of these uh, items. Um, and the department heads, we've asked to come back to us with recommendations for how to reallocate their unspent money uh, going forward. I did want to point out the, the premium pay. As I mentioned to you uh, about a month ago, I did decide to authorize payment to our retirees who had worked during um, COVID. They will get their payments in this week's payroll. We were waiting for the first of the year payrolls to go through so that the payroll office could take on uh, that spending, but those will now be processed uh, this Thursday. So um, you should hear from some of our uh, former employees about that. Behavioral health support, um, we have uh, spent most of the money on crisis intervention and AYCC. Um, we have not spent much of the baby health reserve, and so at some point we will, we will reallocate that. Um, small business assistance, um, we originally allocated $1.5 million, and we've spent nearly all of that, so that's right on track. The same thing for support for the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, tenant assistance, uh, we have spent about 60% of that. Um, and we are thinking about whether there is still room for that or not, and we're in discussions with the um, planning department on that. Food security, uh, we spent all but 100000 and again, there's a reserve of 100000 there. Um, HVAC improvements, um, we have not spent much of that to date, but that's because the uh, RFPs for the design for various HVAC improvements in town and school buildings are out on the street now. We expect those back by the end of the summer and we will then be doing the design work. Um, so it's taken a little longer to get that stuff out on the street and to get it moving, but we do intend to really spend all of that eventually. Um, parks and open spaces have proceeded apace. Uh, water and sewer spending is actually a little bit of a head of space. There's more money in 24 and 25 for that. Uh, and I uh, have been looking at trying to allocate more money for that because there is a huge need. Under affordable housing, I just want to mention that uh, we spent 3 million out of the 4.4 that we've allocated. 
Some of that is just because of sort of ongoing conversations, particularly with um, nonprofits about supporting affordable housing in town. Uh, I do think this money will be spent. It's just, uh, it's taken a little longer to do it than we thought. Um, homelessness is an area where we had some initial uh, allocation of $50,000. Still trying to figure out what the best way to spend that, those funds are. Um, and I think Mr. Feeney will have some recommendations on that going forward. Uh, remote uh, meeting infrastructure, uh, We've just spent a little bit of that, uh, although I think we have very good infrastructure set up around town from various sources for this, um, so we may be able to reallocate some of that. And just administration and oversight, again, um, we'll be able to reallocate some of that. Uh, so overall, this is the program that was laid out to you in May, I think it was of 2021 or 2022, I frankly don't remember, it was the last budget you voted on, um, and it was in May. Um, and um, I think I will say in the next iteration of this, I think we will present it somewhat differently because uh, the way that the federal government wants us to show our spending the categories are somewhat different, so I, I would anticipate a slightly different presentation. But I wanted to put these numbers in the same way that you've seen them before, uh, so that you can see the continuation of what had previously been set out. Uh, with that, um, so we have spent, um, or obligated to date of the FY22 and 23, uh, $20 million of the 24 and a half, uh, plus, um, Going forward for FY24, there's another five million that we will spend uh, for the FY24 budget. Um, so um, if you take that five off the 14.8 that has, uh, is remaining, that leaves uh, about nine, uh, almost $10 million uh, still to be spent or reallocated. And as I said, uh, new incoming town manager Feeney will talk to you about that. With that, I hope I've made clear what our spending is today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. And at this point, I think we can take the, um, the chart down so we can see our town manager on video. And I'll turn to the board if any questions. Mrs. Mon. Uh, first, I'd like to move receipt. Yes. Um, second, my first question, uh, the town manager already answered, which is instead of 14.9, it's 9.9. .9. Um, with a second allo allocation of $5 million for general fund. And then um, I guess I'll just ask the question one more time, although I have had conversations with the town manager, Mr. Pooler, about this. It, it, is it still the case that I'm overthinking and over worrying talk coming out of Washington regarding opera spending, auditing, and possibly losing unspent funds. Is there anything you can add to that again just to reassure me or re-educate me, if I may, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Mr. Pooler. Uh, thank you, uh, Select Board Sorry. Member Mahan. I know there was a lot of talk about that uh, in the public, uh, but I have seen publications coming out of national organizations and out of the MMA making clear that those issues are now off the table. Uh, I will say in Washington, anything can change, but right now uh, I don't see that as a threat to us. Uh, I think it's important that we continue to allocate our funds and make plans to spend them and, um, and spend them in a timely basis, but I'm not worried that they're gonna be taken back by the Congress. Okay, thank you. And then my second point would be, um, Perhaps uh, Mr. Pooler, along with Mr. Feeney, could uh, carry over on this one. Uh, when appropriate, possibly the next reporting period, uh, and I understand Mr. the town manager said the document may look different, which I understand. Um, if the board could be provided along with that documentation, um, sort of a twofold, what I'm going to call a twofold heads up. 
the first part of the heads up is I would be interested in if there were any positions and, and or programs. So that's what the twofold of it is. Um, if we could receive a document when appropriate that sort of gives us a heads up or highlights any positions or programs that have been funded by OPERA and that there should be a serious discussion that when OPERA funding no longer is there, A, we at least get notified that these positions or programs aren't continuing and or if the current or future town manager has any um, thoughts on either of those two. Uh, did I, am I somewhat clear uh, through the chair, Mr. Chairman, to, to Mr. Pooler? Do you understand what I'm sort of asking for? Mr. Pooler? Mr. Chair, thank you. Yes, I believe I do understand that, um, and we will provide further information to the board. Thank you. And I don't mean to be sarcastic with that. No, no, I just no, know no. when I'm trying to couch my question, I sometimes get convoluted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hurd. Yep, just a quick question. Um, so, and I apologize if this has been explained. It's getting late. <laughs> well, for categories such as homelessness, where to date we've budgeted 500000 in the initial budget that was presented and only 50000 has been spent, is it the intention that we're going to find a way to spend 450000 or when Ms. Feeney takes this over and provides us with a new framework, it could be that he – you know, a fair amount of that gets reduced to what's actually needed. Or I know in ge general budgets, if you don't spend it, you lose it. Whereas, you know, we have, you know, a fair amount that was in the tw fiscal year 22, 22 budget for OPRA that wasn't spent. I guess, are we still shooting to hit these numbers that are sitting here, that are in our budget, or are these going to be re reworked once Mr. Feeney puts his hands on it? If I may, Mr. Chair, yes. uh, that call ultimately will be Mr. Feeney's. I would say generally, though, I think with the conversations I've had with the department has to date, I think the issue is what is the best way to serve uh, those people, whether we are spending it on what we would call homelessness or whether it's spending it on things like housing are more appropriate. Um, so I think we understand that there are problems that need to be solved and it may be needing to move the money into different categories uh, on this sheet is the most appropriate way to help those people. Um, so those are, I think, just ongoing conversations we've been having and Mr. Feeney will then present to you, I think, what our thinking is about the best way to go forward. Okay. And that makes sense. I just wanted to, and I'm certainly not saying that Mr. Feeney would take money away from homelessness. I think this was a, a framework that we, we got inundated with this large amount of money and we kind of broke down, hey, well, let's put some here and put some there. And we didn't really know that in practical reality where the funds would be best placed. And I think we did the best that we could at the time. So I would look forward to kind of suggestions as to how to reallocate the funds because we certainly want, as Mrs. Mahon said, we do want to spend the money that we've received and we want to make sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck with the, with the money that we have. Um, so I would be interested to see in some of these categories where it's underspent. I certainly don't think it's because they're being ignored. It's just the opportunities to spend within those categories haven't presented themselves to make sure that we are being good stewards of the money that we've been given and putting the funds where they're most ne needed. And again, I just picked that one category. I don't want to harp on homelessness. It, it could be the same thing for HVAC, um, which that might have been an easier, more gray area to, uh, to use as an example. But um, so I'll, I'll look forward to f further conversations about that. Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, th thank you, Mr. Pula, for the presentation. and, and uh, Actually, had brought the last OPERA fam framework update. It's actually at the end of April, beginning of May, April 20th, and we endorsed certain things. And I have the opposite question from Mrs. Mahan. Um, 
of the monies that have been spent, over $20 million to date, um, there was a procedure where different categories, Powers and Sullivan may have looked at it to say, yes, this is within the framework, it's okay to spend it. Are we, um, we remain comfortable, I guess I'm looking for confirmation that what has been spent to date is all within the allowed categories and there's, there's, there's no uh, issue in terms of a potential look back on, on categories. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, so there are, I think, two questions. One is um, we file our spending reports with the federal government every quarter uh, and so we tell them how money is being spent uh, and so far we haven't heard anything back from the feds that would indicate that there's anything wrong with our spending. Second, uh, we do have these items audited uh, by our outside auditors uh, because of the amount of money involved. It requires a federal audit. Uh, we recently just went through some long conversations uh, with Powers and Sullivan about uh, whether we need to do further auditing uh, of the recipients of this money or whether they were considered sub-recipients, people who are just entities passing the money along to, uh, say, residents of the town or whether they were the beneficiaries of the money themselves. This, frankly, is an obscure federal uh, regulation about how you define things. I just want to say, though, that we did go through them category by category. Uh, I feel confident of their review, Powers and Sullivan's review of our spending plans. And so uh, I don't see any indication on the horizon that we've had any problems. I think we've been spending the money conscientiously. We've certainly spent a lot of time looking at our federal regulations about our abilities to spend. Uh, and I would also just say our comptroller herself has spent a lot of time, as she is very capable and want to do, uh, of making sure that the spending fits the federal categories. Thank you, Mr. Poole. And just one comment. I was very happy to hear you announce tonight that, that you did make the decision for the premium pay for the retirees. You told me that recently. and happy to hear that that has happened, and, and I think all of us on the board are happy to see that. So uh, thank you for that announcement. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sandy. So, um, you know, obscure I means it's where the rubber hits the road. You know, and I know it's really hard, you know, to make sure that you're staying within the bounds. I mean, and so, so I'll, I'll have a conversation with Mr. Feeney because I mean, I, I, I mean, we just have to be careful on the board here, you know, to kind of stay in our lane. I mean, but we all know how I feel about me trying to find I mean, people who, who could really benefit I mean, from this, and I know it's really hard. You know. Um, to, to um, I mean, identify, you know, um, you know people who uh, live in town, you know, or work in town who kind of really could have used the help, um, especially then, I mean, could probably still use the help now. Uh, I know that Cambridge, I mean, has done some, some um, um, let's say, kind of out-of-the-box um, thinking on this. I mean, <coughs> um, also, I guess not so out of the box because we've seen, you know, um, other communities do that. I mean, and I know it would be really hard to implement something like that here, but certainly if we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we are having um, difficulty spending the money, you know, uh, I mean, maybe we should, not should, but could, you know, try to do something a little more um, adventurous. I mean, but once again, you know, I want to stay in my lane, you know, and, and, and I'll stay in my lane. Um, uh, um, gingerly with Mr. Feeney when he comes on board. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have one question for Town Manager Pooler. Um, just so I understand these bottom line figures correctly. So I, I see that we've budgeted to date about $24.5 million. Does that include the additional $5 million um, in revenue loss general fund for FY24? If you could, Ashley, could you pull up the... Um, Sheets again? Yeah, it's up. I'm working on it, sorry. Oh, you're just going to do it this way. Can you see it now, Sandy? Yeah, I, I, I see it now. So uh, we budgeted to date uh, $24 million. Um, 
that just includes five million of the uh, of the revenue replacement, um, and so uh, that's included in the twenty million three hundred forty nine thousand that has been budgeted and spent to date. Just that first five million, um, but uh, it makes it look like there might be an five million more available to be spent than there really is because that five million. Uh, that, that 20, you could almost say, is 25 million uh, spent to date because it's already been voted by town meeting. It just doesn't show up in the 23 budget. If that is, I hope that's answering yeah. your question. Yeah, no, that does. And just, just to further that a little bit, um, what's the best round number to, to understand how much has not been budgeted yet, if any, of the 35.2 million? Well, uh, it's all been budgeted. Okay. It's all, there are budgets for 23 and 24 for the remaining money. I, oh, I, all right, there we go. Okay. So just, but just not showing in this chart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that, this that's is, that's, that's kind of a, a recollection that we already, you know, moved that out. But okay. so at this point, it really is a question of, of, of moving, shifting things between categories, which is what, what you said before in response to Mr. Hurd. So, okay. Thank you. Um, so I uh, still need a second on the motion to receive. Sure. Second. Oh, there you go. And then one quick call. I know it's late. <laughs> but, um, floor, sir. you know, w one area that I'm happy to see that we've spent almost everything budgeted within $9,000 was the, uh, the small business nonprofit assistance. Because I know when we got this, all this money, it really was in response to COVID, and we were trying to identify the areas that needed it most, and that was the essential workers and the businesses. And that shows good management by the town on reaching out to our businesses and showing that, and letting them know that the money's available, and uh, working with the businesses to make sure that gets paid out because that was really important. I know a lot of businesses are struggling, and certainly when we got the allocation, there were a lot of businesses that were really looking forward to getting some assistance to get them through the lean couple of years that they had. Okay. All right, so I think we had uh, we're good. We have a motion to receive by Mrs. Mahana, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Brewer. Please stay around. We've got item 13, vote temporary provisions to parking policy and regulations to incorporate overnight parking pilot. Mr. Diggins. Yes, thanks, Dean. And I'm sorry that um, uh, the unread line version was, didn't make it into your packet because I find the red line version is really hard to read. But essentially, I just wanted to um, have something in place with our policy. Last time we voted in, it was just late, and I didn't want to you know, try to get this back into the vote. You know, but I just feel that it's important that we have you know, a temporary policy in place so that staff can refer to it if residents have a question. I, mean, I got an email, and you know, someone was asking me about how do we go about uh, getting the fee waived. And I said, well, we follow the same policy that we had, but, but I just really wanted the current policy you know, to have you know, this temporary parking. Uh, overnight parking policy, you know, incorporated into it. And, and what I was saying last time is that there are formatting issues I mean, with our current policy that it could just use a fair amount of work. I mean, I'd love to work with um, our staff on that and, and perhaps, you know, Ms. Roman, anyone, you know, who can help us, you know, make this more accessible because I know that we are trying to make I mean, everything on the website uh, more accessible. Um, when I go to update I mean, the policy and and I will update it you know, based on what comes out of the pilot. You know? And so, so I mean, my whole point is that there will be another update to this, you know, um, even the temporary one, when we get to the end of the pilot and come March, whether we decide to move forward or not, I, mean, I will just update it to incorporate what our decision is then. So, but let's try, I, my request is that we just put this temporary in place so that we have something official on the website that reflects that we are in, you know, this um, pilot phase overnight parking. Any questions or comments from the board? Motions? Move approval. Do I have a second? Second. 
Any discussion? Um, I'll just say thank you for your work, Mr. Diggins. I, I thought the, the edits were very clear and uh, made, you know, made, made, made obvious what was going on. So a motion uh, to approve by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is 5-0 unanimous. All right. Take us to item 14, discussion and potential vote, special town meeting. And this is me. Um, so I put this on because I thought that we might be that I might consider in my conversations with various town officials, and uh, we might be ready to schedule a vote for special town meeting. I don't think we're, I'm comfortable that we're quite there uh, for a couple of reasons. One, one of which is, um, you know, Mr. Feeney's about to take over and he, you know, he has to manage a pretty complex uh, array of staff that are leading up to not only the MBT, MBT community's work, on the, on the substance, but also the operations end of, of this. Um, but and secondly, I've been in, in, in conversations with various members of the planning uh, department, and including the, the department head. Um, there is still a little bit of uncertainty about the timing of MBD communities vis-a-vis -vis the state approval process. Um, I know that a lot of people would like to be able to plan their fall who are in, the people who are in town meeting and involved, and I would too. Um, what I would suggest to the board is I think that we're going to have some more clarity. I will have some more clarity in my work um, over the next week or two, and that once that is the case, I don't really want to wait till the middle of August, so I would probably just call a special Zoom-only uh, board meeting to set the date when, when I have a recommendation that all parties feel solid about. We just need a, probably a few more days. Um, so that would be my suggestion. Mr. Hurd? Motion to table to a date uncertain. <laughs> that would be, that would be <laughs> to be determined. Yeah, so we, I, I'll second that, you know, but I, I, um, I guess, I mean, is it that you don't want to have any discussion tonight or you just don't want to make any decision tonight? Um, honestly, I think it's, it's both just because the, some of the conversations about the process uh, were pretty recent um, and are still kind of in the middle of some discussions with the state regarding the timing of the state's review and the best, just the best way to kind of finesse the timing um, for the MBT communities and the fossil fuel pilot. So I could have a much more informed discussion when we, when we, uh, everything's ready. Um, I think we're just a few days short of that, unfortunately. All right. So I guess what I'm, I'm trying to understand though is, is, is it that you are expecting that you will come to us with a date mean and, yes. and because so much is in place, we're essentially going to be you know, kind of just rubber stamping it, or do, is there going to be a point where we can really provide input that could could affect the decision? That's a very really fair question. My intent would be the latter. You know, that, that I would be able to prevent, present, um, and probably invite the, um, the town officials to help present the options for the board to, 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 to choose, because I think it is likely that there may be more than one scenario that we want to contemplate. Okay. So, yeah, no, I think that, that's well said. All right. So it may not be that short a meeting, but that's okay. I'll plan for that. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Mrs. Mahan. And I'll leave this to your um, sort of uh, calculating and working your way backwards, but yeah. just following the MBTA community's meetings and um, there's been sort of like an AI transcript or something that you can read from that um, in terms of, uh, especially around the MBTA communities as you uh, cited, whatever the deadline date is concerning MBTA communities and whether we can make that, um, what that final date is that we can push the envelope because um, for some reason I have it in my head it could also affect the fossil fuels or something. Yeah, they're bound together. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and if for some reason of that two-tiered system if MBTA communities wasn't at the point that it's ready and to submit, what does that mean to that second part? And is there anything we can do to mitigate, mitigate that? Maybe that's no. And then the other thing is if you could, when um, the special town meeting is set and we're looking at uh, the Warren articles that are in there, which I'm hearing is probably going to be a lot of zoning, although this MBTA communities could cut that out. but. If for some reason, just to consider, um, 
if there are quite a few in where uh, the town manager, Mr. Pula, did uh, settle the contract with the police, um, who still, you know, aren't going to see anything, which is nobody's fault, in, until it's voted at special town meeting. I don't know if that's something we can um, dispense of. You know, if we end up with like 40 uh, mm -hmm. um, warrant articles, if we can dispense that uh, sooner uh, rather than later. In terms so. of the ordering of the warrant, yeah. But if there's a logical, legitimate reason we can't do that, then we can't. Yeah, no, that's, I'll take that out of the thing. All right, thank you. Um, I think just to, to briefly answer, though, that, that one of the complexities here is making sure that we, you know, we're really going for compliance with the MBT community's law, which is a requirement, and then we're looking to qualify for the fossil fuel tender community pilot program. Um, and those happen to have the same, essentially the same requirements for changing the zoning um, to allow certain kinds of construction by, by, by right. Um, that's the easy part. The hard part is that they each have their process of review, review, and so there's some finessing that, um, about just the best way to dovetail that right now. Um, Attorney Heim? If I could just add to that, Please. for the board's uh, future planning, probably the, 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 the tightest piece of it is that if we want to participate in the fossil fuel-free uh, demonstration project, we'll need to have some acceptable version of MBT communities in place, and the Attorney General's office gets to take 90 days to review any zoning bylaw. That's not an initial problem under DOER's regulations, but there is some concern that we would have to um, that we would have to have that both passed, reviewed, and approved before the sort of February statutory period. Yep. So th that's probably the biggest elaborate. time crunch that we that we have. And, and just so folks remember, um, you can call a special town meeting relatively quickly, but it still needs to be posted the warrant for 14 days. So we kind of have to build backwards. So wherever the date we want to have town meeting, we've got to have the warrant posted for 14 days, and you can open and close the warrant on the same day. We have to give five days notice before that happens. Okay. So that, you know, yeah. is, is, is one other sort of piece of the timeline time to consider. Thank you, Attorney Ham. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another one of those considerations, and we have some work to do over the next week or so. But thankfully, that's the chair's job. That's what he <laughs> the big bucks. Yeah, yeah, I look forward to telling you. An extra stipend, really. <laughs> that's right. Okay, um, any other discussion on uh, the motion to table by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. Diggins? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Um, item 15, appointment of acting town manager, July 29th through July the 31st. So I get to haul out one of my favorite words in the dictionary, which is interregnum. Uh, <laughs> and we have a period where we, we, we might need to do this, so I thought the better dis, uh, part of discretion uh, was just to do this, uh, that Mr. Pooler retires uh, July 28th, Mr. Feeney takes over August 1st. Um, and so um, we might uh, end up covering and basis in having, having Mr. Pooler name an acting town manager, but I, th I think that it would be wise for the board to do that as well. Um, Mr. Pooler, um, this is a joint issue with you. Do you have any comments or any intentions or advice? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, it would be my intention to name uh, Mr. Heim as the acting town manager for um, July 29th, 30th and 31st. Um, and uh, so I will put that in writing, but that is my intention. My, my uh, intention actually had been to suggest Mr. Feeney. Um, it, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought we had a miscommunication here. Yeah, that's no, quite right. Uh, I think that any, it, we have two excellent choices in front of us, actually. Um, I'm available. So, <laughs> three. Um, my, my rationale, I think, I mean, we really can't go wrong here. My rationale is that, you know, Mr. Feeney might be a logical choice as deputy town manager if you look at it from, from the front end on, of one contract and the, ra and the rational choice for the incoming uh, on the other end um, as well for continuity. I'm not sure for those three days it makes a whole lot of difference, to be honest. So I'll turn to the board for their thoughts. Well, I, I guess I just wonder why we didn't do that in the first place, you know, but, but I'm fine, you know, I'm fine with either one, you know, and so, so. so. That doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try again. Mr. Hurd. 
Thank you. Doug, do you want to be acting town manager on a summer weekend? <laughs> Jim's not here to advocate against it. I'm warning you, I may put on an admiral outfit that I didn't earn with some medals and some aviator shades. Um, oh, oh, well. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm available, so um, I, I, I am present during that period of time. Uh, but, so I, I, whatever the board decides, I'll, I'll obviously be prepared for either a, my typical role or if, if, if I'm needed, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. I just envisioned like a last day of Doug like hazing Jim, like, I'm your superior, you go get me some coffee before, before it all flips around. But <laughs> It might be a good thing. All right, well, th at this point, I'm, I'm really happy with any scenario, but I do need a motion. <laughs> I'll move to appoint Attorney Heim as the Second. interim right. town manager. Very good. We get the best of all worlds. Uh, on a motion by Mr. Hurd and seconded by, by Mrs. Mahan, to appoint uh, Attorney Heim as the Acting Town Manager July 29th to July 31st. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. I used to be able to do this uh, back in the day before there was an additional Deputy Town Manager. It was a little bit more common. So I, I, I do have, I'll break out, I had a little folder that I would carry around just in case something happened. So I'll, I'll find the folder again. Thank you. It's, it, Appreciate your well, in, in that case, this is ob obviously <laughs> the, the right decision. Um, and Mr. Feeney will have his day, and hopefully years. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, item 16, vote to appoint select board designee to, the, to become one of the override committee committee co-chairs. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as we all know that having been through overrides, debt exclusions, um, the main point person for us is – um, part of the trinity, the triad of the override of the three co-chairs. Um, and uh, there is no one finer this time around, I think, than our chair, Mr. Helmuth, to um, be appointed as the uh, select board designee to the, uh, is it November 7th, uh, 2023 override uh, campaign, as well as I know in terms of information the board needs to have, whether at select board meetings or uh, sort of a heads-up reminder from the chair through the select board office in terms of um, upcom upcoming forums and the like that we should know about. So I'd like to nominate Mr. Helmuth as the select board designee to the override campaign. Second. Any discussion on Ms. Mahan's motion? Well, see, there's some like as fine, you know, the Mr. the Corsi, but I'm not going to argue the you know, so so I have full confidence in, in, in Mr. Helmuth. And I will say Mr. De Corsi was part of the Trinity, the yeah. triad, the last time when I was uh Mrs. last override, so he um, he's definitely done it before. <laughs> I think Mr. DeCourcy is a little bit too eager to express his confidence in this year <laughs> for this very, very big job because <laughs> he knows what I'm getting into. All right, and a motion uh, to appoint the current chair of the select board uh, as the select board's chair, uh, co-chair spot for the override campaign committee by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is 5-0 unanimous. Okay, that takes us to correspondence received. Request additional signage from Katie Tremblay, Oxford Street and Winter Street safety concerns um, by a number of residents in that neighborhood, and a stop sign request of Regis Road at Everett Street from the Arlington School Committee. I, will, I did want to note that on the item 19, um, that although I anticipated a colleague of mine may well want to refer this to TAC, and I think that would be entirely appropriate, there is some short-term examination being <coughs> done by, um, by uh, a cadre of town employees uh, professionals to just take a look to see if there is any kind of short-term option that could uh, inform the tax board. Mr. Corsi? Yeah, just a, a comment before a motion on, on, on number 19, and, and I know we, we received the letter. I was in here at the meeting on June 5th when the initial letter came in, but um, this, this issue, and, and sometimes it goes to just communication <coughs> and, and um, how, we, how we move forward, but back in 2021, on September 27, 2021, the Regis Road residents came before us and, and uh, we voted through the Private Way Act for them to repave that road. And part of the discussion that we brought up at the end there was 
because Regis Road was going to be repaved, they may want to come back to us because of the stop sign issue. Um, and, and Regis Road is a little bit more complicated because it is a private way, but we we're commenting on Wellesley Road and Patrick Street, putting stop signs in within a week of hearing from those residents, both of those roads being public ways, making it a little easier. But um, for people looking back and, and for those who want to go back and take a look at old select board meetings, it's about 40 minutes in. We had a, a, a discussion about that need, and I think this is an example of the type of thing where it comes before us as much as we refer things to TAC, and TAC is very valuable. I think especially with this follow-up and we, we see that this issue, I'd like to see these type of things handled through the board and, and the town manager, DPW, and the police, uh, as opposed to referring it out because it seems if you go there, the issue on Regis Road is exactly what we had on Wellesley and Patrick, the only difference being Purcell is a one-way across from Regis, but Regis goes right into Everett Street. It, it seems like we should be able to do that quickly um, and, and uh, as we go forward and uh, you know, not, not have letters coming in from the school committee suggesting that we do things, and, and you know, that goes to communication as well prior to those type of votes. Well, well I, I, Mr. Mr. Sure. So I'll just say that you know, TAC has been, been looking at, at this, you know, and, and, um, and so I don't want to get ahead of the chair uh, on this, me, but, but um, me, so it's to say that me, I'm glad that you're working with staff, me, and because some of those staff me, are on TAC, me, and, and then yeah, me, uh, providing you know, valuable feedback. Me, that was a, we had a good meeting um, last week, me, um, and so, so, so yeah, and, and I'll also say on the additional signage, me, and I'm trying to remember if I've only seen the presentation in TAC meeting and that it didn't come before the board, me, about things that we're planning to do at that intersection. You all aren't remembering that, right? And, okay, so then it's only been presented in TAC. I'm not sure why it hasn't been presented to the board, so I will talk to the chair, me, and, uh, and so, uh, so, so, uh, was it motion made? Not yet. No. So, Go for it. Sure, you know, so, so, I mean, should I refer to model attack or, or was I hearing something different from? You heard something different on number 19. Yeah, yeah, 19, 19 yeah, challenge. Yeah, 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 so yeah, okay. Fine, right, so then let's refer to the other two, you know, to pass. Perhaps receipt on the 19 then? Yes. Yes. Sorry, Second. Second, Mr. Hurd. Second. Any oh. further discussion? Okay. Um, no, that's that's worthwhile, and I, I do want to say I appreciate uh, both both Mr. Diggins and Mr. DeCourse's points. I mean, tech is extraordinarily valuable, um, and I think that you know we can we can move because as, you, as Mr. Diggins points out, we have overlap with the same much of the same staff. Um, I know that the staff person I'm working with, Mr. Alessi, and I wouldn't say I'm working with it. That's an overstatement. Um, he actually let me know that that you know it, it, given the sort of time sensitive request from the school committee that they're, they're just going to take a quick look and see if, if a quick recommendation makes sense. Um, it may or may not, you know, but it's still it's still with tax. So I kind of like, I, I rest better knowing that, that there's a couple of approaches, but I also know that they're not going to, um, because of who's coordinating, we'll, we'll avoid any duplication of effort. Yes. And, and, and I can talk with the chair to find out me what she's comfortable with me saying you yeah. Know, yeah. Uh, in, in a meeting and, and just framing the context. I mean, this is what we discussed. I mean, but, and, and if they want me to report out something official, I can do that too because, because I mean, we're liaisons, I mean, especially this committee, I mean, for a reason that hopefully right. they all makes the communication more efficient. Uh, Good. Yeah. Sure. Good. All right. So on a motion by Mr. Diggins and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Five to zero. All right, now we have board and staff announcements. Um, I'm going to be a little unorthodox and lead off, and that's because there aren't that many times where you have the last meeting of a town manager at a select board meeting. And Mr. Poole, I hope you're still with us. Um, I want to I will have four full remarks at the celebration um, on July 27th at the Town Hall Auditorium. And this would be a good time to invite the public and town employees uh, to attend. Doors open at 6 p.m. There'll be remarks at 6.30 and then by some, by all reports, some good quality food and drinks at 7 p.m. Um, all to celebrate the, the remarkable, um, exceptional 32-year career in public service by, by Sandy Pooler. Um, I'm particularly grateful for his service to Arlington since 2016. He came on as deputy town manager, um, really made 
a stamp in a lot of ways. I think the consolidated um, finance department, um, financial department in, in the town is at the top of my list, but has also been a champion of the EI initiatives, particularly in his last year as acting town manager, or as, as, our, as our town manager for the year plus a month, um, in so many other ways. And I think we, I am very grateful, Sandy, for your steady leadership during this um, period between our, our longer term town managers, the timing worked out really well. I know that you had the confidence of your department heads before um, and during your tenure. And, and you know, we're grateful for your steady leadership at the helm during this period um, so that we could take our time, make a fantastic decision to bring on Mr. Feeney, and uh, know that we are grateful not only for your service to Arlington, but to the service to the public for, for uh, 32 excellent years. And uh, I will be further unorthodox by inviting the town manager to make his <laughs> board and staff announcements. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I don't really have any new business to announce, but I did want to take this moment to thank the board uh, for the opportunity to serve as Arlington's town manager. Uh, this is a very well-run town that has a history of being well-run that goes back decades. And I am very happy to be a cog in that wheel to help it continue to spin along. It's been my pleasure working with all of you and uh, with other board members beforehand, but particularly in this last year, and to see your dedication to the residents of this town, the citizens of this town, and all the programs that uh, we put forward. Uh, it is a great place to work. Uh, we have a fantastic staff. We have numerous, numerous citizens who volunteer their expertise and time. And we are very lucky to have a select board of people who have demonstrate over and over again their commitment uh, to those citizens, to the progressive, forward-thinking values of this town. Um, and so I want to thank you again for those opportunities. I do look forward to having you all at the celebration party, um, and at that point, I will probably make some more remarks about 32 years in public life. Uh, but for tonight, uh, again, I will just close out by saying it's been a pleasure working with all of you. Thank you, Sandy. All right, we'll go back to our regularly scheduled announcements. Mrs. Marr, Ms. Marr. That's oh, okay. I, I, keep, I, I gotta stop doing that. That's okay. I would also like to congratulate Sandy on his long career and thank you for stepping up as town manager. I look forward to celebrating with you at your retirement party on the 27th. The only thing I'd like to also add is that the parking pilot program opened today. Um, we've received 25 applications. So wow. we had to line up the door at 7.30 this morning and 25 as of today. <laughs> so are that's you, it. Are you serious about the line at the door? Or? Yes, I'm very serious. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Attorney Heim. Uh, if the board will indulge me, I just want to share in my, I don't know if I'll get a chance or not later on, um, to just express my gratitude for the opportunity to work with Mr. Pooler, uh, who has been a public servant for his entire uh, career. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I think sometimes just gets taken for granted, although Mr. Pooler alluded to it, is just how well run this town is, how lucky we are, and how much we make that luck um, through this board, um, through uh, its town meeting members, through uh, the chain of folks who work to keep this community operating at a extremely high standard. Uh, Mr. Pooler has taught a lot of us things that we didn't know we needed to know. Um, his experience and breadth of experience in municipal government in particular, uh, not just in the finance side, but in the operations side, uh, is something that uh, so many of us probably who thought we knew a lot, <laughs> were humbled by. Um, and this past year, it's been a wonderful opportunity to work with and get to know uh, Sandy in a whole new array of ways um, as the manager. Um, so I, I, Sandy, I will miss you and um, very much value all the things that you've imparted to me and many, many other uh, staff who have not only enjoyed uh, your leadership, but the 
things that you have uh, been able to bring to the table that, frankly, there are just very few municipal uh, government workers with that level of depth and knowledge. So um, I am happy for you, uh, but uh, we, will, we will miss you and your wisdom. Thank you, Sam. Well said, Mr. Ryan. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know there'll be more remarks on, on July 28th, and the Chairman certainly has encapsulated it. But, you know, first I want to say to Mr. Pooler, to Sandy, congratulations. Uh, job well done, or jobs well done. Um, uh, I wish you a long, healthy, happy retirement. And I was trying to think of something that's sort of unique coming from me to add to <laughs> <laughs> what I could impart w with Mr. Pooler. But one thing I do want to say, which I think is sometimes really difficult, and uh, different managers, town managers have risen to the challenge, and some have fallen flat in their face, and Mr. Pooler certainly did not do that. I do appreciate the fact that um, the, the town manager, Mr. Pooler, has to deal with five really distinct uh, personalities um, here on the board. We have an awful lot of commonality uh, in terms of uh, what it is uh, we do when we're doing our job, but we go about it different ways. And I do appreciate the fact that um, no matter how uh, passionate I got about any one issue, uh, Mr. Pooler uh, treated that professionally, didn't take anything personally, even when I kind of pushed the envelope five times too, f too far on the table. Um, and I will say that I may not have always gotten my way, but I always felt heard. And, and um, I will say, you know, um, in the end, um, I can stand by decisions that Mr. Pooler has, has made because I know he uh, put a lot of thought and uh, expertise and professionalism into um, those decisions. And uh, that's something I do appreciate. Uh, even when uh, I thought maybe a different road or path um, should go down, um, I certainly felt listened to as well as given an, uh, an explanation for why, you know, he's the town manager and he made the decision he made and uh, I'm not. And um, I, I really do respect that because uh, sometimes that's difficult because I know him a lot. But uh, so I want to say thank you, Sandy. Um, God bless you. I, I've helped you earn this retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hurd. <laughs> well, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, no, I do want to thank you for your years of service. Um, we got put in a, a tough spot a year or so ago, and uh, you really stepped up and really helped maneuver us through that situation. And uh, you were the perfect guy the perfect time for the job and you've done an excellent job um, through your entire career and certainly for your career at the town of Arlington reworking the finance department that is your fingerprints will remain on our town finances for many years to come in a good way um, and then as the town manager you you jumped into your new role and hit the ground running and really were always responsive when I reached out to you and um, you did a really excellent job and I know many, many people here will, will miss you, including everyone on this board. I do wish you well. I envy you. I'm not there yet, but um, I do, uh, you know, hopefully you get some some summer months left and good weather. Well, as soon as you retire, all of a sudden it's going to stop raining so, so you can have some time to enjoy your retirement. So congratulations. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, yeah, I also want to congratulate Mr. Pooler and thank him for his service to the town and, and his public service throughout his career. And, and uh, as, as Mr. Hurd said, um, Mr. Pooler came in at a, at a time that, that was difficult. We didn't have much time to act in terms of naming a new town manager and, and right from day one he was a, st a steady hand and, and um, I really appreciated that. I know department heads and, and employees in town were very happy that he was named and that's, that's a testament to the respect that they had for you Mr. Pooler and um, I also enjoyed during the past year through, through work on long range planning you and I would have preparation meetings before and, and debriefs after the uh, long-range planning. I, I enjoyed those meetings. And, and one thing 
two, two other things I want to mention is that very early after you were named, you made a point of having meetings with us, getting to know us a little bit, and, and uh, I was really fascinated about the breadth of your career. I knew about Amherst. I knew a little bit about Newton. I didn't know about the House of Mass House of Representatives, and we had some people in Newton that we both knew, but I enjoyed the stories of uh, earlier days in, in, in your career, but I appreciated just getting to know you uh, better. I mean, I'd seen you at meetings at, at, at Finance Committee, but uh, really enjoyed those extra meetings that we had in the past year and really appreciate the work that you've done. Um, I also appreciate, and I think the, the whole board does, the work you've done with Mr. Feeney since we named him, because this is going to be a, a, an easy transition in terms of um, him coming into the job. You've you've seen ahead and there are things even tonight with the opera discussion that you've said, okay, that's something for Mr. Feeney to do. I know there's some uh, hiring decisions that are coming up that, that you said, no, that's that's more appropriate for him to do. And that's, that's a big hand to him. It, it, it's mentorship to him, particularly with finance related items, but it's, it's also good for the town in terms of passing along that knowledge and, and allowing him to grow even before he starts on the job. So thank you for, for an outstanding career. Um, I look forward to July 27th and, and look forward to staying in touch after you retire. Mr. Regan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Announcements? Announcements? And, and hi again, Sandy. You know, I didn't see this coming. I should have. I mean, I should have known that hey, we were going to say goodbye uh, this meeting. I was waiting. I was going to say goodbye to you at our weekly Monday meeting, you know, and then maybe again, you know, if I hopefully can make it to the retirement party, you know. And so um, I hadn't really prepared anything, you know. I, I, I will just say it is really nice when things that are so apparently logical work out and then work out as well as you hoped they would, because it did seem really logical at the time, I me mean, for um, Sandy, you know, to take over after Adam left me, you know, and and it seems, um, yeah, you know, so, um, uh, um, and so as I said at the time, a really big thank you. I said at the time, you know, and I say it again now, uh, and and I, I meant it then, I meant it even more now, you know, and. And, um, and Sandy's been able to handle 30 minutes, approximately 30 minutes of the land, of the adjusted land, <laughs> every Monday, too, which is, you know, um, a testament to his, his patience. But I've learned a lot, you know, um, and I appreciate that, too. And, and, and also, I mean, as with, with Adam, I really appreciate your candor, you know, about me, my thoughts on things and, and ideas, and that, that always helps more than anything else. So thank you and good luck. I believe that concludes our business for the evening. I didn't oh. a motion to. Oh, no, 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 actually, actually one, 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 one quick thing. Of course. You know, at the next meeting, even, even maybe in the next short meeting, um, we could decide maybe our second meeting date in September. That would be helpful. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, right, I think I know what it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll get that in, Jimmy. Thank you, sir. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Well, we have lots of options there. And a motion by Mrs. Mahan, a second yeah. by Mr. Hurd. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned.